Did you ever think you would make it? I feel I'm supposed to take sweet victory. I know this life meant for me. Yeah, why would you bet on Goliath when we got bet David? Value taming, giving values contagious. This world of entrepreneurs, we get no value to hate it. How they run, homie, look what I become. I'm the, I'm the one. Episode 303, a lot going on right now with one being OpenAI 700 out of 770 employees at a company worth $86 billion have threatened to leave and possibly go to Microsoft to follow a man called uh, Sam Altman, who was fired by the board and Microsoft only found out a minute prior to that. We're going to talk about that today. <laughs> if you can just go to Tom and see how much, how much, Look, how many I mean, pieces of paper he's got. got he's in on my notes. area. He's ready he's for that. He's in my area. Two, we have Argentina had a, uh, a wild man, the Elvis of Argentina, uh, uh, wins the election. We got a couple clips to show. One that no one's ever seen before. We may, you know, show you a glimpse of that uh, a clip as well. Oh, okay. uh, he, <laughs> oh he really? lost it. He lost it. That one clip no one's ever seen. We'll show that here to you. And then we got a few other things going on. We have uh, Roger Stone in the house. The reason why Roger Stone's in the house is, one, because uh, this man's got very interesting takes. He's lived a very – he's a qualified you're – you're a qualified unusual suspect, I would say. <laughs> qualified. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. But also tomorrow happens to be the 60-year anniversary of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And one of the best books written on that – uh, New York Times bestseller, The Man Who Killed Kennedy, A Case Against LBJ. If you've never read this book, we're going to put the link below as well for you to go order this book. And uh, we're going to talk about that as well. So, Rogers, great, great to have you on. Great to be here. Yes. Yeah, so we got a lot to go through story-wise. I say we get right into it, if that's okay with you. Let's do it. So let's start off with, uh, I want to say, let's start off with uh, OpenAI. Okay, let's start off with OpenAI on what happened over the weekend. So... Microsoft says Altman Brockman will lead new in-house AI team, which makes no sense because when you think about ChatGBT, you think about a man named Sam Altman. Okay, and let me let me read a little bit more on what Microsoft is telling us here. So Sam Altman has been appointed, uh, who is the co-founder of uh, OpenAI, to lead its new in-house. AI team with Microsoft following Altman's ousting from his startup. Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella expressed enthusiasm for this move, stating, I'm super excited to have you join as CEO of this new group. Sam setting a new pace for innovation. This decision comes after a series of dramatic events involving Microsoft and OpenAI, including Altman and Greg Brockman leaving the latter company. Microsoft has been investing heavily in OpenAI with a roughly 49% stake and a significant focus on integrating OpenAI technology into its lineup. Uh, apparently 700 out of their 770 employees at OpenAI have said they're leaving. The partner said they're leaving. A bunch of different things are going on. No one has more insight on this than our friend here, Tom. Tom, what is your take on what's going on here with OpenAI? Well, a bunch of things have happened overnight. I think everybody saw and everybody, even if you are a sports only news fan and we're only watching football over the weekend you saw that uh, the board um uh a guy named Ilya Sutskiver um goes to the board and says hey you know we got a lot of concerns here with Sam um and they fire him on Friday all hell breaks loose Microsoft is like hey what was that what's going on down there they didn't even know about it and then on Saturday you know Altman's like I don't if I want to go back. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. And Sunday, Altman goes to the um, to the office there. And it's funny, he he tweets or he puts a post on X of a guest badge. Like, here he is. Can you show this picture? Yeah, he says, uh, he's this visiting. is the last he's time First and last guest. time I'm going to be wearing a guest yeah. badge at this company that I've been driving in the future of AI. Well, yesterday, some really crazy things happened. So let's let's add to it. Yesterday, Microsoft says, you know, with 700, Microsoft's got a $13 billion investment in here, and you've got um, Thrive Capital, Coastal Ventures, and Tiger, Tiger Go Global. By the way, Coastal Ventures, led by the great, you know, Vino Coastal himself, who is saying, hey, I want, I want Sam back there. Thrive says me too. Tiger says me too, because they all have investment in open AI. 
And Microsoft is like, well, you know, we'll work with Altman no matter what is what uh, Nadella said. And then Nadella said, you know, irrespective of where Sam is, Microsoft, or back at OpenAI, something he said yesterday, he said, he's working with Microsoft. <laughs> So Nadella looks at it that way. I've got $13 billion in open AI. If he's working for us with Brockman, that's great. Yesterday, yesterday something broke that was very interesting. Ilya Sutskever officiated Greg Brockman's wedding to him and Anne. So there is a close dynamic there. Ilya did not think Brockman was going to walk with Sam. Wow. Did not think. Soap opera. And it, it is. And so when he does that and all the employees have now signed this, the other investors are worried now. Wait a minute. Because Nadella goes yesterday on news coverage and says, at this point, I think it's very clear something has to change around governance for the future. And for all of them that wish to leave, you have opportunities to work on our AI initiative at Microsoft. So Microsoft is basically saying, hey, don't worry about benefits. If you leave, you're here, which led the other investors to completely freak out. And yesterday, if you got the, if you got the uh, tweet, Ilya says, I am making a U-turn. So this is what he did. Elias says, I deeply regret my participation in the board's action. I never wanted to harm OpenAI. I love everything we built, and I'll do everything I can to reunite the company. And so, let's Same guy that broke it apart yeah. is willing to reunite right. now. And However, you saw that Sam responded look with at three the heart sentence, Pat, Pat, would you accept this from anybody? I don't think you would as a leader. You know what's going on. I regret my participation in the board's action. The board's action? You went to the board. It wasn't the board's action. You went to the board. I regret my participation in the board's action. It's like you voted with the board. You didn't. You went there and said, this is what we have to do. Sam's got to go. This is what it is. The other thing that happened overnight which I think you'll find interesting. Check this out. After they let Sam go, they called Dario Amodai. Who is Dario Amodai? Dario Amodai is the co-founder and CEO of the number one rival to OpenAI, Anthropic. And they said, do you want to be CEO? We're letting Sam go. That was the board's plan. And they said, uh, he said, no, I don't want to do that. And they said, well, would you, merge, would you merge with us? So they're trying to merge the two. So look at what the board was doing. And before the board even got, then they get a no from there. And then the board has to run around. And before Emmett Shear accepted the role, they called Nat Friedman, who had been at Microsoft after Microsoft bought GitHub. And then they called Alex Wang, co-founder of Scale AI. The board was in complete freakout mode after they let Sam go and all this was going down. And they're calling Anthropic and they're trying to merge and they're calling these people and this. And then 700 people signed a document. Nadella says, hey, you, you 700 want to work for us? That's fine. I think all of this is going to get back together and we're going to, and that open AI, Sam's going to be running it. The so let me ask you a question. Gone. There'll be a new board, and Microsoft will be on that board. Uh, so, so, so here, so Tom, OpenAI, eighty-six billion dollar company. There was a time that they said they started it as a nonprofit, right? That they finally converted as a profit. That that's correct. In two thousand nineteen, they converted to a profit after starting as a nonprofit with people like Peter Thiel, Elon Musk investing. So now here's a question, Sam Altman, how much equity does he have in OpenAI? I just googled it right now. It says zero. That's correct. How? Why? Because he was part of the, he was part, so he, he had more than enough to his name, and he really wanted to lead OpenAI, so he was leading it as the nonprofit. Yeah, but, I mean, he doesn't have a piece of equity in OpenAI. What, why, who the hell in the right mind would think it's a good idea to have the founder and the CEO of the company not have any equity in a $86 billion company with zero incentives that doesn't lock him into one of... Who, who thought that was a good idea? That is a great question. And the board converted in 2019 because they were having trouble recruiting talent. So they created this organization where the board oversaw the nonprofit, which controlled and oversaw the for-profit and had an entity created so they could give people equity and, and part of the upside. And by the way... 
Thrive Capital wanted a bigger piece, and they're a current investor, and they wanted even more. They offered to buy some of the people's equity so they could have a bigger piece at, a, at the $86 billion valuation. Yeah, I totally get all that stuff you're saying, but, but uh, here's a question for the board. What makes you think it's a good move? For the guy that should have more incentive than anybody else, for the CEO to own 0% equity in the company, that you can't lock in the board. Are you? It's not like this guy doesn't have money. He's got a few hundred million dollars. I think he's a half a billion auto guy, 700 million auto guy. He's made some money. But you're talking about something that goes from zero to $86 billion with the money that he and Elon Musk put up, right? Because it was originally supposed to be a... A charity, a nonprofit. Yeah, and they then, were all. It was all donations. It said, and they have forms that said that the early money put in by Elon Musk was a donation to the nonprofit. Is this, is this also a way where Microsoft sits there and says, "We don't care if we lose eighteen, thirteen billion dollars. We're getting the guy, and now we can own a bigger percentage of the whole thing. That's going to be all Microsoft, not not just an investment." Is that kind of how they're looking at it? That's exactly how they're looking at it. And I'm going to teach everybody a new word in Silicon Valley. There's a word called aquahire like acquire and hire, aqua hire. So let's say you love a group of engineers, but they're working on something and it's just not working out. And you tell them, hey, Pat, um, you, Tom, and these guys, tell you what, we're going to give you five million bucks, wind down the company, pay some of your investors and law firms, but you come work for us. And we're going to give you new equity and we're going to do this. You join us. That's called an aqua hire, where they basically give you enough to close one company that yeah. hasn't got transaction tr traction and come to the other side. And everybody was saying Nadella just, by the way, Microsoft's stock popped up and it closed at an all-time high, $2.75 trillion at when all of this all of this was going down on Monday, and everybody, everybody in Silicon Valley is saying, you know who the 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 biggest the biggest gorilla in the uh, in the jungle is, and that's Satya Nadella. He basically just pulled off an aqua hire where he gets the brain trust of OpenAI, up to seven hundred people coming to work for him for the price of thirteen billion dollars. And if he wanted to buy and just acquire OpenAI, it would have cost eighty six. That's a uh, very interesting. And by the way, some may say thirteen billion dollars is a lot of money. It is a lot of money, but it's like having three uh, two thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars, and you're investing into something thirteen bucks. That's kind of what it means. Like it, it is money, but it's not really that much money to Microsoft. Adam, yeah, I think. Um, and Tom, great breakdown. Thank you. That's by the way, uh, you know, twelve trees died. Yeah. for that story. So uh, right minimum, on. I want Tom doing my opposition research <laughs> going forward. <laughs> He will. You do not want to get on the wrong side Roger, of the Roger, it would be a privilege to work with you. You're, well, <laughs> you are a legend. I think um, one thing that we shouldn't lose sight of, it, it, um, amongst all this, this artificial intelligence and artificial general intelligence and basically robot learning, uh, everything still comes down to humanity and being a human. I, I, one of the words, uh, Tom, you said one of the words that you just learned before all this was, was it called Aqua? What was it called? Aqua Hire. Aqua Hire. Acquisition never heard that. Acquisition Up until hire. about a year ago, a, a, a term that I've never heard of, I mean, I get it, was the whole being a humanist. Do you remember that Elon Musk basically said, listen, when it comes to AI, you have to understand that I'm a humanist, which that's never been a thing where you need to advocate for being a human. But that's essentially what this comes down to. Uh, in the midst of all this, of AI and artificial intelligence, especially when building a company, it still comes down to interpersonal relationships. And clearly, there were some major issues going on within the board, within Sam, within everything. And it's good to know that humans are still running companies, Thank God. Uh, despite everything that's going on here. And, and in fact, that was actually the uh, crux of the issue that was going on here. So if, if you look at what this guy Ilya has said uh, over the last year, it's all about the safety concerns of AI and how it affects humanity. He argued that basically human values uh, and humanism needs to be at the forefront of everything that's going on here. He basically said that uh, the company needs to uh, set up a super alignment team with 20% of the company's computing power to ensure the safety of humans. So it's good to know that people are looking out for humanity here. He basically said that... Um, he told employees that the biggest concern AGI will treat humans the way that humans treat animals. Basically, like, red alert, like, humans could become second-class citizens with the advent of um, AGI. And then just to kind of put a ribbon on this, I don't know if you saw this, that Biden recently, by the way, shout out to uh, our friend Joe Biden. It's, it's his 81st birthday. 
So Happy birthday. I know that people are I don't even think, about I don't that. Even think he knows. I know we're going out to the club tonight and celebrate. I don't even think he knows it's But he signed he, an he executive. Look a day under 90. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. He set up a, uh, he signed an executive order basically um, with AI oversight. He invoked the Defense Protection Act, Pro Defense Production Act, which basically highlights privacy and national security uh, in regard to things like deep fakes and all that. So, uh, amidst all this that's going on and Tom's amazing breakdown, it's good to know that humanity is still at the forefront Raj, of AI. what do you think about the story? Uh, look, I, uh, AI, AI to me is a great piece in the Wall Street Journal about 10 days ago. I think it's extraordinarily dangerous because, as the headline says, nothing will be real. So at least within the world of politics, uh, you can produce a video now seamlessly that makes it appear that your opponent or those you oppose say and do things that they never said and done. I've been a victim of this. Uh, so therefore, I think it's extraordinarily uh, dangerous. Uh, and voters don't necessarily have discernment. So, oh, I know Biden said that because I saw a video of him saying, except for he never said it or, yeah. or Barack Obama. You said so, you were a victim of this? Oh, also? God, there's, a, there's a ton of deep fakes on, uh, online. They're not very well done, by the way. Really? But, but a lot of stuff out there, sure. Huh. Well, uh, I have a few enemies, you know, so it is. <laughs> so you, Choose your enemies wisely. So, so you know, uh, going back to this, I think every time there is an era of like an Oklahoma land rush, people lose their minds. Right now, this is not a trillion-dollar idea. This is probably a $10 trillion idea, what OpenAI is, okay? So you know how $86 billion is what it's worth today? Okay, if this is a $10 trillion idea over the next 10 years, what is $86 billion? What is $10 trillion divided by $86 billion? You know what it is? It's roughly 110x what it is today. Maybe even 120x, 115x what it is today. That means you invest a billion dollars <throat> over the next 10 years. That billion could be what? 115 billion dollars. Yeah. Okay, that is the power of <laughs> what this company is capable of doing. These board members, you know, the 770 employees have said we are not coming back unless if the board resigns. Correct. Oh wow. There, it's, there's only 770 employees. 700 employees have said. We are leaving if Sam Altman was fired and the board has. So imagine how a company works. You're sitting on the board like, who do you think you are? We own the board and we own the shares and we own this. And you're fired, Sam. Sam, you own nothing. You get an email from 700 employees saying, hey, board, I know you got all this power. Guess what? You want to fire Sam? If you don't fire yourself, you may as well fire us because we're out. We're going to go elsewhere. Guess where that 700 is going to go to? Straight to one company. Guess what that company is called? It's called Microsoft. You know what happens to Microsoft all of a sudden? Wow. Microsoft becomes the first ten, tr ten trillion dollar company in America in the world. Tom, oh, uh, there's something else here. We're talking about the board, the board, the board. For those of you that have a business, or those who may be serving on a nonprofit, board is everything. There were nine seats on this board that were occupied at the beginning of the year. Nine. One of them by Reed Hoffman, who is the founder of LinkedIn, who ended up sort of at Microsoft, because Microsoft owns LinkedIn now. So what's really interesting about is Reid Hoffman said, hey, I may have a conflict, I need to step off the board. Two other people this year stepped off the board. This is a normal thing. Uh, most people will sit on boards either forever or less than three years. It's usually just a, a time period. So guess what? That took the board down from nine to what? Six. Sam Altman said he was kicking himself and he, he was quoted on this yesterday. I was kicking myself because I didn't replace those board members. So it went from nine to six. Wow. So when they walked in there to do it, Elia got one board member, Helen, who is a Georgetown fellow or panelist or something like that. And he gets her to go along and says, the first thing we need to do, so let's do the count. There's six people on the board. And Elia walks in. First thing we need to do is let's vote to remove Greg Brockman from the board yep. because he'll probably vote with Sam. Yep. All those in favor? Yes. Four. It's okay. We're, we've had, we have four votes. That would be four to two if they were here to vote. Boom. They move them. Now there's five people on the board. Do you see where this is going? And now let's vote to remove Sam. Well, Sam can't vote. 
and he doesn't need to vote, and he doesn't even have to be present because they have quorum present. So then these four people did it. So you see what happened? Boards are supposed to be large and diverse to have opinions, to have diversity of thought, and to debate and process things and have sensible people coming from different angles. The smaller the board gets, the dumber the board gets. Or shall we say the more, not dumber, but maybe the more... Um, blind spots. In, blind spots, spontaneous. And so... You also don't want it to be too big. You don't want it to be 15, 17, Correct. 9, 11. 9 and 7 are the most popular yeah. numbers because they're odd numbers, uh, as, as you might imagine. But take a look at that, Pat. You've had companies where you've had boards, and there's part of what happened is they boiled it down to four people made the decision on this. And that's what... Uh, look what Mark Benioff just said right here. I just sent this to Rob. Mark Benioff, Salesforce... Uh, will match any open AI researcher who has tendered their resignation will, will full cash and equity OTE to immediately join your, join our Salesforce uh, Einstein trusted AI research team under Silvio Savaris. Send me your CV directly to CEO at Salesforce.com. <laughs> Einstein is the most successful enterprise AI platform, completing one trillion predictive and generative uh, uh, transactions this week. Join our trusted AI enterprise uh, uh, revolution. Interesting. It is a dog-eat-dog dog, 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 eat dog type of an environment right now. Everybody wants to recruit mm -hmm. the talent leaving OpenAI. Everybody. Yeah. And Microsoft now either controls it, and they're going to have a board seat in the restructure. You better believe that. Or they own it. They Pat. either absorb it or they own it. But I don't think the other, these are big other investors that I think are going to want to see OpenAI like put back together with a strong board, but it's basically going to be Microsoft's toy. Dude, uh, Elon just tw retweeted. He says, drop the open AI, just Microsoft. It's cleaner. Like when Mark Zuckerberg. What uh, did I just say? It's yeah. Microsoft's uh, toys. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, my uh, the biz doc kind of touched on it, but I just want to get your opinion on this. Go like for it. When a board fires the CEO and founder. Yeah. Right. I want to know what that looks like internally and then externally, how that affects the company. So like it, we all saw that happen with Steve Jobs in, in what, like the late 80s. Mm -hmm. We saw it recently with uh, our buddy James O'Keefe. Now the latest with Sam Altman. What does that look like when this happens, when the board fires the CEO? Well, let me. OK, you bring up James O'Keefe. When's the last time you followed Project Veritas? I when James was there. Yeah. That's what brought attention. I think they went belly up, actually. I know. Did, but, yeah. but we're tied to a personality. Right. right? So. Until the brand becomes bigger, yeah. then that person goes away. It's timing. For example, Steve Jobs passed away at 56 years old. Everybody thought, uh, 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 what do you Apple's call it? Apple's finished. done with. Yeah. It wasn't. Apple ended up Tim going Cook. from a $100 billion company to a $3 trillion company because at that point, Apple was bigger than Jobs. $100 billion today is not a lot, but $100 billion when Steve Jobs died. What year did Jobs die, Rob? Is it 2006 or 2000? Eight, what is the year Steve Jobs died? Could have been 11, one, uh, uh, 2011. 2011. Like, okay. So he dies in 2011. Everybody's like, it's over with. 12 years later, it's a $3 trillion company. But by that time, Apple was already established. You cannot do it with early stage founders. Yeah. And when you fire the, uh, the CEO, in many cases, it's valid. Like, this guy did something. Okay. Like when uh, Uber fired uh, the, Travis the, Callum. Travis yeah, and yeah, they praised him with Dana. Uh, yeah, in many cases, it, it's – like, for example, like, even – remember when uh, uh, New Year's Eve, Dana White, his wife, and everybody's like, oh, he should get fired. He should get this. You should take time away. He's like, <clears throat> screw you. No, I'm not taking time away. Mm -hmm. I screwed up. I'm going to have to deal with this with my family. Do you think I'm embarrassed about what you think? No, I'm embarrassed with my own family. Let me deal there. So bored – got pressure from media, board got pressure from left media, board got pressure from couple investors, and board pitched to Dana, maybe want to take a month or two months off. Mm -hmm. This is speculation. And then Dana came back and said, you're talking about, I'm not doing this, I'm here. If they would have fired Dana, I mean, it's the ultimate black guy for the brand of uh, uh, UFC. Because Good word they, used, by the way, by it, the way, black guy, UFC. Yeah, yeah. You're the nail on that head. But basically, so the, the the whole thing becomes like you can't get rid of a guy that's got that kind of loyalty from the audience. And obviously, mm -hmm. guess what Sam Altman just proved? He's got it. And Sam Altman has been arguably the face of AI. Like name anyone else when you associate with AI. But you said a lot of times when the board fires the CEO, it is valid? Yeah, many times CEO. Why uh, is that? Listen, if you're... <laughs> 
you know how many times they give the money and CEO gets a couple dollars and then he goes cruising a little bit and like took uh, a couple, work, uh, m- m- couple dollars off the table and, you know, he stops being accountable, gets to his head, arrogant, you know, doesn't come to work, becomes casual, becomes, it, it, that happens a yeah. lot. What's the, the, the workspace thing that everyone used to? We work. We, we work, exactly. Yeah, we work. What happened with that guy, Adam? He's still a billionaire and, and he's still going to get money and he's still going to raise money because he's crazy enough to get money. But so, many times it does make sense. You know, the, the last shot on here is Sam Altman. Um, he's also known as Y Combinator. He led Y Combinator, which is like the single most successful and fruitful, ex, you know, small business accelerator that's ever been known to mankind. And it, at the end of the chapter there, they were saying, Sam, you know, you're working on open AI, you're working on all these projects. Can you really give the time to Y Combinator? Shouldn't you step away from this because you're doing actually too many things? So Sam did. He stepped away from Y Combinator mm-hmm. as, as, the, as the leader. And one of the things that happened recently is he was over with the Saudis talking to PIF, uh, which is the Saudi fund. And he was asking them about investing in a company that would design and make AI chips to compete with NVIDIA because he thought that NVIDIA having too much market share was like monopolistic and that wouldn't be good. And he didn't want to have AI's reliance on one company. So he was out doing that, actively trying to raise money for that as well as in in the billions of dollars. So they said the board was also concerned about him maybe doing too many things. And they said it was a breakdown in communication. Uh, I think we'll know. I think more will come out. There'll be things that come out. I don't want to be like literal. Here, Tom, on it, here's but. all you need to know. If 700 out of 770 are saying they're going to leave, he was doing more than enough to have the loyalty of 700 exactly. out of 770. Wow. Uh, I'll wrap it up with this and we'll go to the Argentina story. When you find a relentless founder who's driven, bought into a vision, worker, has technical skills, <laughs> It is very, very hard to find people like that. Very hard to find people like that because they increase valuation, and that's exactly what he was doing. Rob, let's go to the next story. So, wild story. Out of nowhere, you hear Argentina elects shock therapy libertarian Javier Milley as the president. Reuters story. So... Argentina likes libertarian outsider Javier Milley as its new president with nearly 56% of the vote. He pledged economic shock therapy and stated Argentina's situation is critical. The changes our country needs are drastic. Milley radical plans include shutting down the central bank, ditching the peso, and implementing spending cuts. He resonated with voters frustrated by the economic crisis and won support, particularly among the young. Milley victory disrupts Argentina's political landscape and economic direction. He has criticized China and Brazil, emphasizing stronger U.S. ties. However, he faces the challenge of a fragmented Congress and addressing the country's economic woes. Rob, can you play one of the clips? Let's go to the clip of him uh, giving the message with the lady he's doing an interview with. Yeah, right there, if you can make this one in. Great hair, Good, by Guys, the way. just read the caption. First of all, he looks like an Argentinian uh, Elvis Presley. Yeah. But what? watch what he's saying. Guy, read the captions. Go for he's it. He's a wild man. Al zurdo de mierda no le podés dar ni un milímetro. Pero, pero me podés definir zurdo de mierda que no Todos lo los que, digamos, los colectivistas, <laughs> los que ponen, digamos, o sea, esa idea. A ver, ¿Qué, es... ¿qué le pones de mierda, digamos? Porque son una mierda. <laughs> o sea, <laughs> me quedas... No, pero, eso, pero es que eso es de mierda. Pero, no, pero, digo, pero si pensás distinto, te van, a, te van a aniquilar. Ese es el punto. Es decir, vos al zurdo no le podés dar un milímetro, porque le das un milímetro y lo tomas para destrozarte. Es decir, usa, digo, o sea, vos no podés negociar con el zurdo. No se negocia. No se negocia con esa mierda, no se negocia, porque te van a llevar puesto. Si tienen un golpeador que caga trompadas a la mujer, digamos, si es de ellos, ¿entendés? Se pone el, wow. el pañuelito verde y grita todo el tiempo contra el neoliberalismo. Lo ocultan. ¿Me entendés? O sea, si de repente hay alguien que acosó a otra, a una periodista que acosó a otra periodista, lo ocultan. Es decir, a todos los de ellos lo ocultan. Todas esas aberraciones la ocultan. Ahora, si vos estás del otro lado, a vos te van a estropear, te van a matar, te van a dar con lo que sea. No les importa arruinarte la vida. ¿Por qué? Porque no pensás como ellos. ¿Y sabes qué es lo bueno de todo esto? Hay algo bueno en todo esto. Porque como el error es humano, 
como todos nos podemos equivocar, ¿sabes qué nos obligan? Nos obligan a ser mejores. Y como estamos siendo tan mejores con ellos, como los estamos aplastando en la batalla cultural, los estamos pasando de arriba, porque no solo le ganamos en lo productivo, somos superiores moralmente, somos superiores estéticamente, somos mejores en todo. Y les duele, les duele. Entonces, como no pueden pelear con las herramientas legítimas, se, apa se apalancan en el aparato represivo del Estado, poniendo torres de guita para hacernos mierda. Y aún así no pueden, no pueden. Tuvieron que bajar la nota. Tuvieron que bajar la nota. ¿Me entendés? Que están perdiendo. Están desesperados. Están perdiendo la batalla cultural. Los zurdos de mierda. Por primera vez se ven acorralados. Los zurdos de mierda. Okay, what's your reaction when you see this, first of all? Uh, the only thing worse in politics than being wrong is being boring. This guy is never boring. Yeah. So he understands uh, that politics is entertainment. If you can't entertain the people, if you can't get their attention, then you can't educate them and you can't persuade them. At the same time, he's genuine. I mean, that's really him. I mean, this guy... Yeah, he's a true believer. He, you he, can tell. He, he fronted a, rock, a, a Rolling Stones rock band for years. Mm. Uh, his dog is named Milton Friedman. Uh, he is a, he is a radical libertarian. Uh, he is well versed, at, at, you know, in von Mises and Hayek. Uh, he's put forward an extraordinarily radical agenda. Uh, he's uh, you know he understands symbolism. He shows up with a chainsaw at one of his press conferences. He dresses in superhero <laughs> costumes, uh, and uh, he's right. Socialism has brought their country triple digit inflation, uh, a looming recession. Uh, and uh, new levels of poverty. So, uh, I mean, the guy is, he's on fire, uh, and it's, people don't recognize two important things. One, he's not from either one of the two major dominant parties who've dominated Argentine politics for the last 40 years. He's actually, a third party won this election, which you know, has never happened before there mm -hmm. or here. And secondarily, Argentina has 100% paper ballots. There are no voting machines. And they tabulate all their ballots on election day that night. Now, that is not to say that vote stealing is unknown, which it just simply means that you have to have a very aggressive poll watching operation to make sure that no paper ballots are, are stolen. So uh, I thought he might win. The polling was uh, much closer, but uh, he, he's really on fire. Uh, and uh, he, he totally understands the, the dynamics of the dire situation. Uh, and that shock therapy is going to be necessary. Rob, do you have the other clip of him pulling all the tapes off and, you know, off the wall? Uh, this is this is fantastic. Watch this one here. Bueno, lo primero que tenemos que entender es que el Estado no es la solución. El Estado es el problema. Ustedes, si se fijan acá, tienen la gran raviolada que es el Estado, el gran curro y la fuente de la decadencia argentina, que es el Estado. Esta es la foto del Estado que tenemos hoy. Si nos movemos hacia aquella pizarra, Fast forward, a little bit Ministerio updated, de right Turismo there. y Deporte, afuera. Ministerio, Ministerio de Cultura, Cultura. <laughs> afuera. Ministerio de Ambiente y Desarrollo Sostenible, afuera. There goes green. Ministerio de las Mujeres Ministerio y Género y Diversidad, afuera. Diversity. Ministerio de Obras Públicas, afuera. afuera, afuera. Aunque te resistas. Vamos a seguir por acá. Ministerio de Ciencia y Tecnología e Innovación. Nada bueno salió del sector público. ¡Afuera! Ministerio de Trabajo, Empleo y Seguridad Social. ¡Afuera! ¡Afuera! Ministerio de Educación. Adoctrinamiento. ¡Afuera! Oh. Ministerio de Transporte. ¡Afuera! Ministerio de Salud. ¡Afuera! Ministerio de Desarrollo Social. ¡Afuera! ¿Cómo queda el Estado? Ministerio de Capital Humano, Ministerio de Infraestructura, Ministerio de Economía, Ministerio de Justicia, Ministerio de Seguridad, Ministerio de Defensa, Ministerio de Relaciones Exteriores y Ministerio del Interior. Se acabó el curro de la política. ¡Viva la libertad, carajo! Oh, my God. This guy's a rock star. Long Check this live out. freedom, so, damn Rob, it. Do you have what happened in our booking meeting yesterday? I think so. you guys got to watch this. Watch this here, the booking meeting yesterday. Very important clip. Go for it. Look at my hair. Listen, listen. Look at my hair. Is that your real hair? Yeah. <laughs> Argentina! Argentina! <laughs> 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 Watch. He's on fire! He's on fire! Vinny's a 
inspired. Vinny, that's awesome. Man. Was... I'm worried, Pat. I think he's... I Vinny, Vinny wore the uniform for the USA. I'm worried he's going to defect. Oh, Saca la boca, cabrón, te están mira baseball. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Tom, what do you think about when you see this candidate, Argentina, what's happening to the world? Um, I agree with what Roger just said, is that this guy understands the symbolism and he understands how he's communicating. And he, is, he as a third party, gets 56%, 55.7% of the voting populace who are being rocked by three things. Unemployment inflation and zero vision for the country you look at the and that that angst is living under there is argentina where are we going are we going to be this economic light for latin america there's no vision there's no vision coming from the leadership and, once and there's the inflation and unemployment so the people are desperate and all of a sudden this guy talks about turning it down and giving him a place to go and being the one guy that's got the balls to walk in and do it and 55.7% say, that's my guy. Yeah, once the one of the 10 wealthiest countries in the world, Buenos Aires was considered the Paris of South America. That's right. Yeah. So the country's known prosperity, but they're in dire straits. Uh, and the socialist he ran against was the guy in charge of the economy. Talk about a bad hand. Yeah. So uh, uh, he's a friend of mine. Uh, he's uh, read my book, Stone's Rules. He took it to heart, obviously. Uh, he's. Uh, I'm, I think I'm going to go down for the inauguration. I'm very excited Say. about it. Uh, the people who ran his campaign are very, they're very young. I mean, they're very uh, digital savvy. He ran a very modern, effective campaign, but it's really built around him and, and his personality. Well, pa, well, and I'll, by the pa, way, go back to what you just showed, and, and then Vinny, I'll come to yeah. you. Go back to what you just showed, the data, Rob. 50, so check this out. 99.4% of voters tallied in presidential runoff. Merely had 55.7%, and economy minister Sergio Massa, 44%, according to Argentina's Electoral Authority, it is the highest percentage that a presidential candidate has received since the South American countries returned to democracy in 1983. Well, and, and, and Roger, just going off what you said about you know them, and I, I think you got to give a little credit where credit's due, Roger, because this type of political attitude, you were technically the architect, because you know what Trump was running, or actually in the 80s when you recommended that Trump should run, you saw the value, Raj, of the outsider image. He's the outsider. Uh, also someone who brings business experience to the political process. And because your philosophy when it came to politics was anti-elitism, not, not big government. So in essence, you this is the direct result. This guy's <laughs> attitude, this guy's vision, this guy's like movement in the political party, Rogers, because of how you treated uh, them in the 80s. I right? think his appeal, I think his whole thing is very similar to Trump in 2016. I mean, he, you know, he's... He's not coached, I'll tell you that. He's not, <laughs> he's not handled, he's not managed, he's not scripted. Uh, what you see is, is what you get, and people mm. respond to authenticity, uh, particularly in dire times uh, where this guy has a very radical prescription. Uh, he's got a lot of obstacles, there's, there's no question, but in a larger context, I see this as a precursor for the United States in the sense that Brexit was a precursor for Trump's election in 2016, uh, this, I think, is an important uh, victory uh, for the forces of freedom and anti-big governmentism. I love the use of the word precursor because one of the things that was going on here, I was seeing flags there, Roger, I'm sure you picked up on this, that said, don't tread on me. That comes from the dawn of American independence, and that was a message from, mm. the, from us. Remember that we have to, uh, what was it, Thomas Paine said, if we don't hang together, we will certainly all hang separately, and don't tread on me. Those th symbolism showing up in flags that they're waving says that these Argentine people who may be young and the people that are voting understand the importance of what we call the American experiment. Yeah, no, they, the, the young people love America. They love everything about America. So it, it is, uh, and they're very, very attuned to our pop culture. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I Every, add, almost everybody said good things about him getting elected. Here's what Trump said about it, by the way. Trump said, congratulations to Javier Milley on great uh, race for president of Argentina. The whole world was watching. I'm proud of you. You will turn your country around and truly make America great again, uh, truly make uh, Argentina great again. But here's what even Lula said good things. But here is what mm -hmm. Colombia's president said. The extreme right has won in Argentina. Sure. It's the decision of its society. Sad for Latin America. And we'll see. Dot, dot, dot. The relationship between Colombia and Argentina, the bonds between their communities are maintained in mutual respect. 
However, I congratulate Millie. Uh, yeah. How's Columbia doing, by the way? How uh, are they doing? Yeah. Not too good. No, exactly. Well, exactly. that's where I was going with this, because I was in Columbia about a year ago, and I saw what was going on there. I'm from born and raised in Miami, and I've seen basically half of Latin America move to Miami in the last decade or so. We all saw the, basically what happened when... Uh, Cubans all came here in the in the 80s, everything that happened with Fidel Castro and a multitude of that. But if you look at what's going on in South America, obviously Cuba and Venezuela are as socialist, communist, Marxist as it gets, but it doesn't end there. If you look at what's going on in Peru, Bolivia, Argentina, Chile, um, certainly in Mexico, um, Nicaragua, but then you have certain outliers like what Nayib Bukele is doing in El Salvador. Credit to him, he's, he's a libertarian crypto advocate. Um, this guy right here, um, Javier Milley, is the first libertarian candidate ever elected, ever, period, in any country. I don't know if you know that. But um, the, you mentioned that you need personality and you need policy, right? This guy has a combination of both. We have arguments and debates here all the time about, well, certain people have this and certain people have this strength. I can think of a certain candidate running for governor right now, run, sorry, running for president right now, <laughs> That is great on policy, just personality. He doesn't have that afuera thing going on, my friend. Afuera. But if you recall, and this guy is a what, what they call an anarcho-capitalist. Right. So just deep libertarian ties. And if you look at it from an economic standpoint, what did your friend Ronald Reagan say? The most terrifying words that you'll ever hear is, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Right. And that's essentially what this guy's basically saying is like, the government overspending and the printing of money and the inflation and uh, the economy that's going on in Argentina has led to this. And this outsider has just shown up with his chainsaw and basically said, we're going to end this thing. Afuera. Well, Bukele has proved that change is possible, yeah. that you can take a country in deep trouble and you can reverse that trend. Uh, and uh, this is going to be a, this is going to be an important experiment but in the same thing. I, I agree. And by the way, I'm looking at this. Uh, the economy in Argentina... 140% inflation, 40% living below the poverty line mm -hmm. is what led to him winning. So here's a question for a lot of Americans. Does it need to go there for you to realize what works and doesn't work? Okay. Does California need to go there before you realize what works and what, what doesn't work? Well, maybe. Does New York need to go there before, before mm -hmm. you realize what works and doesn't work? You know, it, it's, it's repetitive when this takes place. A person like him comes in. You know, finds out the frustration of all the people. They vote for him. Argentina gets better if this guy is able to even live and survive. I was just going to say. Argentina gets cool. better, and he does what he does. And then, oh, this works. And then all of a sudden, they bash the rich people, and they bash the wealth that's been, been made by people that once were poor. And then it goes back to, now we're rich. How come we're not taking care of our poor? Then you spend the money, cyclical cycles. The same way generational wealth stays with certain families for few years, most families' generational wealth only stays for one or two generations before kids or grandkids spend the hell out of the money. Generational wealth also goes with countries. Most countries who become very wealthy, it only stays for one generation or two before a socialist shows up and wants to find a way to spend that money to give it to the poor to get elected, and then they realize that was not the right format, and another person comes in. While we're looking at this, here's what happens the other day. Numbers come out, okay, numbers come out uh, that Biden's presidency, poll, NBC, standing hits n new lows amid Israel-Hamas war. And this isn't a Fox News story. This isn't a Breibart story. This is an NBC story. President Biden's approval rating has hit a new low of 40 percent with strong disapproval of his foreign policy and handling of the Israel Hamas, according to NBC polls, a significant drop, which uh, Rob, if you don't mind just playing the clip, play the clip of what they were saying. The one. Yeah, right there. The, the one you just showed in a picture right there. Is this the Steve? Just, just watch this one meet here. Just watch yeah. the reaction to it. This is meet the press. Go for it. Here it is. Wow. Donald Trump. We have at 46 percent. Biden, 44 and this is significant because this is the first time 
in the history of our poll that former President Trump beats President Biden still within the margin of error, but still significant. Yeah, it's 2019, 2020, when Trump was president, he trailed all of them. This year, he's trailed all of them in our poll. First time in more than a dozen polls, we've seen a result like this. Some of the other ingredients that go into that, Biden has long had an advantage over Trump on likability. Look, at the start of this year, 39% said they had a positive view of Biden, barely 30 of Trump. We've seen consistently a gap like this. Now the gap is gone. Mm. 36 positive on both and actually Biden one point more negative than Trump. That's been a significant advantage for Biden. Our and poll says higher that advantage at least poll, for now may course. be gone. Right. And we talked about younger voters on foreign policy and it's true on a host of other topics. Damn. Disaffected with Joe Biden. We have 46 percent for Trump, 42 percent for Biden among the youngest voters. The youngest voters in the 2020 election were Biden plus 26. This could be a massive did sea you, did change. Did you hear what he just said? And if you take a look here, too, Under, uh, was all, plus, everybody sort okay, of says. Go back to what he said right there. Go back 10 seconds, Rob, if you can. Yeah. Right there. Okay, go a little bit back three more seconds. Right, yeah, go for it. Play, play this. Listen to this. The youngest voters, the youngest voters in the 2020 election were Biden plus 26. This could be a massive sea That's change. That's positive right there. And if so plus 26 during the election with younger voters it's flipped 28 uh, tw uh, it's flipped 30% because now Trump is plus four on young voters and it used to be Biden plus 26. Keep playing it. If you take a look here too, all, everybody sort of says, hey, I'm not too nuts here's about the, the possibility of this matchup. So we said, let's measure this one way. Some. And here's how we did it. Yeah. Biden against an unnamed Republican. This is just a referendum on Biden, basically. Right. And look at this. Yeah. He goes Scott. from being Tim a, a dogfight <laughs> yeah, with Trump to being sure. double digits behind. But then flip it around. Trump against an unnamed Democrat. Trump goes from leading against Biden to being down Newsom by six smile. points Generic against the Democrat. Democrat. Just yeah. a Newsom. fascinating look at the state Newsom of the race with Michelle just a little Obama. under a year More to likely. go. Steve Kornacki, great stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Steve. Great stuff. Steve. And, and Pat, you know, you know, well, the, yeah, first yeah. of all, they pretend that the New York Times Siena College poll 10 days ago didn't show the exact same thing. They pretend that the Bloomberg Morning Consult poll uh, in the swing states didn't show the same thing. Oh, this is shocking news. This is not shocking news. This is the trend. Uh, what's significant is that NBC is now saying it because that means mm -hmm. Barack Obama has decided that Joe must go. Professional Democrats realize that Joe is not up to another campaign. Uh, they cringe at the idea of an Obama-Trump debate. Uh, that that blows their mind. Joe Obama got, Trump uh, par debate. Pardon me, I misspoke. A, a Biden yes. Trump debate. Pardon me. Thank you. No uh, and they and they uh, uh, Joe doesn't want to go. First yeah. of all, Joe doesn't want to lose the legal authority to pardon himself and his brother and his son and other members of his family. Uh, and uh, Jill certainly doesn't want to go. It's not it's not in so coincidental to me that on the day. Barack Obama props Biden up on X. David Axelrod, his right-hand man, is out saying, uh, if we nominate Biden, we're going to lose. So I think there's an internecine push going on in the Democratic Party as there's a growing uh, re uh, realization that between the impact of his, uh, of his domestic policies, his inability to perform as a candidate, uh, the mixed messaging on the Middle East where they're trying to please everybody and therefore they please nobody mm -hmm. uh, and the growing scandal surrounding corruption in the Biden family adds up to Joe not being able to make it again. And therefore, I think the, they're going to try to push. Roger, who, Roger. who's going to make that decision to say, President Biden, thank you for your service. Please step aside. How does the inner workings, the inner plumbing of the DNC actually work? Who's making that decision? The, the most influential Democrat in the country today is Barack Obama. There is yep. no question about that. And these these affiliated news outlets uh, respond very much uh, to him. Uh, he can he can. Uh, and the way their convention is set up is very different than the Republican convention. So you can dump a nominee because of the superdelegates far more easily. So the fact that that uh, the filing deadlines have already passed in the Democratic primary and caucus mm -hmm. schedule for uh, for New Hampshire, New Hampshire and Iowa have been neutered. They've taken away their delegates to make South Carolina the, the first contest a state with an absolute majority of African-American voters in their primary. The Chicago, the convention is where? Chicago, uh, mm -hmm. the Obama's hometown. 
I have predicted for some time that Michelle Obama is the most likely Democratic wow. nominee for the simple More reason. More than uh, Newsom? Uh, here's, some, uh, here's why, quite simply. You have a, a, an African, pardon me, you have a woman of color who's the vice president. She's next in line. How do you how do you rationalize passing her by? If Joe doesn't run, how can you get away with passing her by? She's got to pull the line. race card. You have to right. do it. Of so, Identity so, politics. So you, you, so you replace a woman of color with a far more popular. So you're going to have two color. women running the country? No, 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 I'm no, out. No, not necessarily. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but I, I don't think that they can. I mean, you can't just bypass Kamala Harris. Despite the fact that she doesn't have dementia, but she makes less sense than you. <laughs> uh, so, but how do, how do they convince? Like, what does he say uh, after much consideration with my family? I've realized that yeah, uh, during these difficult times, I'm just well. Uh, he can certainly uh, demented. He, like, how does it he, work? Uh, his health will not just just won't allow it. His yeah. health won't allow him. He doesn't look well. Or yeah. You know, he so what everyone's been well, saying the, is basically and the document. I mean, the, and you said this, yeah. Raj, on the unusual suspects that the document thing is still kind of lingering. They could always go to that. I, I there, here's a telltale sign that they're in trouble when you have people with Trump derangement syndrome like Michael Rappaport lo losing his mind yeah. and Cardi B. Do you understand? Cardi B can't even speak English. She's going live with all her fans. Remember, she was interviewing Trump and she's like, I like you like politics. No, stuff. interviewing Biden. B interviewing Biden back yeah. in the day. They yeah. interviewed her twice. And now she, for you know what's bad, Pat? When people like her are starting to turn, you know 100% Joe Biden, you already nailed it. There's no way he's running. It's... No. Yeah, Let's see what Cardi has this to say. The political and, and the, this is Cardi B. This is She knows what she's talking about. The context for this clip is that there's $100 million in cuts to social services and other programs in New York, and that's why she is against She's Biden. getting involved. Yeah, before we play this, the context was Eric Adams, mayor of New York, said, I'm having so much trouble and so much cost with all this immigration that's landing on here. I need the federal government to help, and if I don't get the federal government to help, I am going to lay off these people, cut this, cut this, cut this. So Eric Adams was trying to blackmail the federal government yeah. into sending taxpayer money to help him. And this is the response from a citizen. And and, and before you play, and, and it was Tom, he was going to uh, get rid of cops and get rid of $1 billion for education. Yep, that so was that whole it. basket of threat. Yeah. Yep. Go forward, bro. Not, this is what I'm telling y'all. I'm not this year. Don't fucking ask me. I don't give a fuck <laughs> the resume that they send. I don't give a fuck. I'm not endorsing she no more like like presidents by the way. no more. Because how is that a hundred... Hundred million dollar budget cut in New York City for for um She's trying to read fucking schools, library, uh police safety, and sanitation. Yeah, Joe Biden's talking about like, yeah, we could fund two wars. We could fund two wars. Motherfuckers talking about we don't got it, but we got it. Like we're the greatest nation. No, the fuck we're not. We're going through some shit right now. <laughs> wow. oh, like, so say it. Say really, it. you finally really woke up. Through, uh, she, we, she's we, a non interventionist No. She's the singer that's right saying WAP, right? Yeah, her WAP oh. is about to get dried up right now because guess what? Yeah. There goes there goes the country so, that you Worst that, ass president. Worst? What, what is, <laughs> right. I got that wet let's ass see what, what, uh, Let's see what rap reports are. Go, go ahead. <laughs> Look at this freaking psycho. It's down to pig dick Donald Trump and smoking Joe Biden. I'm sorry. I am sorry. Voting for pig dick Donald Trump Pink? is on the, pig, the table. Pig. Oh. I'm sorry. Uh oh. I'm fucking. So, I'll still call him slob dick Donald Trump. What a loser. Pink dick Donald Trump and all that. <laughs> Trump derangement syndrome. Big time. But we need to get this whole fucking situation under control. Oh, uh, but guess what? Too late. And, and and this Pat, and this is what drives me crazy. We told you like that. This is this is what Trump derangement syndrome does. Where the personality you didn't like the coddling and the rubbing of your head while you were getting screwed over. Now I'm I'm happy to see this. Right? Hang on, listen to what he says there. At the very end, what does he say? We have to get control. Listen to what Roger was just saying, and you can see the plan inside. The conventions are very different. Hillary tried to gain, game the superdelegates as part of her strategy. It wasn't a natural primary. Remember how she looked so calm, cool, and collected, not worry about polling and things they were doing as candidate junior senator from Illinois, Barack Obama, who had done a great speech at the previous DNC, suddenly is gaining momentum. You saw that's, that's how it works. That's where it's coming from. Roger, I'm with you. I think what's going to happen, we're going to get to the convention. Somebody's going to say, Joe, the superdelegates are moving the other way. You're going to get the pardon. You got to pardon your son. You got to get the stuff out of the way. That's going to be messy for us. And we're done. I believe it happens with the superdelegate manipulation at the convention. Is bingo. That bingo. But, but Gavin Newsom, who's very, uh, I think, effectively 
advertising his availability. <laughs> you cannot replace uh, the the woman vice president of color with a white male. You just can't do that. So he gets to be vice president on Michelle Why Obama's not, ticket. Though? What do you Why mean? not? What do you mean? Because the dynamics of their party will not allow it. Who gives a shit? Are you if you're gonna lose the most woke. You think that this woke ass left is gonna let? Because uh -huh. you know they're gonna say you let a white man take over. <sighs> yeah, Are you crazy. Because yeah, he's Some more no, capable. No, Adam, let, 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 let me. Go nuts. Let me. Donna, Donna Brazil goes. I, I'm with Roger. Donna Brazil and others go nuclear if you try to do that. Yeah, well, yes, well, she's they, the one. Yeah, they, they, they do. Here's what's gonna happen. Here's what's gonna happen. I mean, the the, the guy uh, Mealy, if you read what he said. He said, if you're uh, on the left and you molest another journalist, as long as you support pro-abortion, they'll hide it. Yep. If you're this and you do that, as long as you support their Green Deal, they'll hide it. But God forbid if you're on the opposite side, they want to kill you. They will destroy you, right? Okay. Andrew Cuomo is by far one of the best case studies. COVID starts. First six months, <coughs> this guy would have been a better president than Donald Trump. He's this, he's that, he's this. Flag okay. And then you look at Andrew, and you see somebody that's probably not going to be a yes man to Schumer, to Nancy, to Obama, to any of these guys. And then all of a sudden, like, wait a minute, I'm convinced he wasn't listening to what he was doing and what they were asking him to do. They said, okay, you want to do this? Do you forget what we have on you? We will destroy your life. And guess what they did? They did. They did. Not the right. The left, the left. did it they to themselves. They eat their own. So guess what's going to happen? They have a book the size of a Bible with enough ways to destroy Biden. Ugh. That one's going to be an easy phone call to make. But they don't want to get to that point. They want it to be a nice, friendly one to get to Biden. And they have one as well with Kamala that they can destroy her as well. And that one's going to be a little bit complicated because I think she'll fight it. I think she'll fight it a little bit like uh, uh, Andrew Cuomo would. When they try to do that with her, eventually she's going to have to come out. Then at that point, they'll pick whoever it's going to be. But by the way, it, it's it's the DNC is when? It's August of next year in right. Chicago. Correct. The RNC is July of next year. I want to say in Milwaukee, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yeah. So I know the next debate coming up December 6th is, is in Bama. But they're going to do Milwaukee as the uh, RNC. They don't want to have a lot of time left, okay? Mm -hmm. They don't have a lot of time left. If they're going to make their moves, they got to make their moves fairly quickly to get that guy out. And when I say guy, I mean Biden. I think the hard one's going to be Kamala. Well, first of all, they'll be looking at the polling between the two conventions. Trump will get a bounce out of his convention. That'll scare the crap out of them even more. Secondarily, Kamala's not that difficult to solve. You want to be on the U.S. Supreme Court? Good. All you got to do is step aside. We win the election. We win the Senate. You are the Attorney General of California. You can be on the Supreme Court. They buy her out. It, and she goes quietly. That's my guess. Wow. I don't know if she's going to It's go going to be the easiest campaign for the right to run with. Oh. Easiest campaign. They say they for women. They told her to sit in, in the back of the bus. <laughs> yeah. They say yeah. they're for blacks. They told her to do this. Well, yep. All talk, no action. Yep. Don't trust the Democrats. Yep. They only want to, your vote, but once you vote for them, they won't do what they say oh, they'll and, do for and you. And let's face it, though. Joe keeps, making, campaign. Joe keeps making this easy for them by, by being Joe. I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, running from the from the turkey pardon, like because he I think he crapped his pants. He it definitely did. To me. Yeah, it looked like yeah, it. Looked he like crap. It. Uh, not knowing well, where to put up the wreath uh, at the Vatican tomb of the other soldier. I mean... The more this guy is in public, the more uh, dysfunctional he appears. That what? just that just fuels uh, this. What's this, move. Rob? He's he's on he's at the White House on the White House lawn, and the, I guess the turkey just came out. This is well, a hundred just, hundred year tradition. The president pardons one, and he turkey. has to take a poop. This is I got to go take a poop. Go ahead. Watch Rob. this. Hey, look at that, hey guys! I gotta just jump. No, like how embarrassing is this guy? Look, they're not they're not even done coming out yet. Look at this. He's gone. Is this, when did this happen? Yesterday. He just was like, I got to go take a crap. He left everybody on the lawn. I don't know about all that. What do you mean? He did. Did they he, leave I'm the just mic on? That, that, there's a million could. other clips we could have played that are way worse than that. No, but he I'll tell you what. But there's one every day. That's the point. Yeah, the, no, no doubt. But if we can go to that general election stat that Pat kicked us off with, that's scary. I agree. But that's not the scariest stat that we've seen in the last week or so. So what was that, 46, 44? No, not that, not that one, the initial one. The scariest thing with Roger alluded to initially is the battleground states and the swing states. There's five states that dictate basically what's going to happen this election. Roger knows this better than anybody. We know that California and New York is voting blue. We know that Alabama and Tennessee are voting red. That's not even a question. 46-44. 
we know that the election is going to come down to the, you know, it's a clo- too close to call. We already seen this a million times. Comes down to five states. And these are the polls. This is um, New York Times and Siena College. Not exactly uh, right Cred- wing. Credible. Uh, exactly. Credible uh, methodology. Trump versus Biden. Nevada, swing state. Trump's up 10. 10. Georgia, up six. Arizona, up five. Michigan, up five. Pennsylvania, up four. Those are the states you got to pay attention to. And if Trump's in all big in those five states, this thing's done. But, but Roger, what do you, Roger, what do you think? Okay, do you think what's happening in New York is enough to stick? Because the left is always up to something, Roger. Like, we're not stupid. I know I know you you get it. We spoke about this uh, the other day. What is what they have on Trump enough to make him not run? Uh, there's no circumstance whatsoever under which he does not run. None. If he, and if he, he said this, if he has to run from a prison cell, he will. As long as he's not convicted of a crime that makes him ineligible to be on the ballot or ineligible to be president, uh, and he, 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 if they martyr him, they might even make him stronger. That has certainly been, it's counterintuitive, but that's what's happened so far. These prosecutions of him have turbocharged his campaign. And I think yeah. I think that trend will continue. Roger, what's your relationship with Trump at this point? I know you've been a surrogate. You've been an advocate. He... He's very good. I saw him okay. uh, two Fridays ago. Talked okay. to him night before last. You guys have known each other how long? 45 years. Wow. And uh, what's his just overall... You know, he, he's tenure. How's he doing? He, he's, What's his... he's surprisingly confident. I mean, this guy has got ice water in his veins. I mean, he look. I worked for Nixon. I worked for Dole. They're very, very tough guys. Trump is the toughest guy I've ever met. I mean, he 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 really just lets it roll down his back. I mean, under the kind of pressure that he's in, he's yeah. he's resolute. He's determined. He is a little angry, but Maggie Haberman's right about that. But I think he has every right to be angry. But mm-hmm. he's not unhinged. He's not hysterical. He's not depressed. Uh, he's he's really in a surprisingly good mood, uh, and, and he's absolutely convinced that he will win. He's absolutely convinced that. Whatever they throw at him, he can handle. When you hear things like he's thin-skinned and he's like a man baby, what's the reality of I what's have, going I on? I have not. I've never experienced that, and I spent a lot of time with him. I traveled with him now about a month and a half ago for four days, and I was surprised at how you can you can be in a situation twenty years ago and walk away from it and come back, and everything is exactly the same. Mm-hmm. It's exactly the same. So Bill Maher says Trump is beating Biden because he would clean cities. Bill Maher attributed Trump's polling success over Biden to the perception that Trump would take proactive measures to address deteriorating cities. Maher uh, humorously pointed out the temporary nature of San Francisco cleanup efforts, stating, put aside the fact that you can clean up the with company coming over. He elaborated when he talks, I'm going to put us put people in camps, the immigrants, all this kind of stuff. And people just see a place, a country especially in those cities that look out of control. Donna Brazil and Adam Kinzinger, guests on a Mars show, concurred with Mars' assessment. Anyways, uh, 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 Brazil emphasized that people clean up when something different happens and raise questions about finding long-term solutions, particularly with homeless individuals. The reality of it is, right now, if this guy comes back and he wins and Argentina did what they did, Italy had it a couple years ago, more and more people are just kind of going to leave me alone. I kind of want to build my life. I don't want to be controlled the way I am. If it happens in America, I, I think this is going to be a very weird, entertaining four years if Trump wins. Again, if he wins. It is so early. It's second quarter with, you know, five minutes left. <laughs> it's not even halftime yet. Would you agree? It's second quarter with it, five minutes uh, left. Uh, yes. And in and, and politics, a week is a lifetime. A yeah. week. And right, things right. can change very dramatically. Do we have a, a, a terrorist attack uh, on American soil against American interests? That would change things. Uh, Let's what, pray not. Uh, no, well, ob- obviously, but it's a very real possibility. We have yeah. let several with the open borders. millions and millions of people into yeah. the country that we can't even identify. We know what, there's 128 people on the FBI's list. How many got through the, that we didn't catch? So uh, it's going to be a tumultuous 12 months here. Uh, mm-hmm. And... Uh, all of those events can change everything. What's the likelihood that the Democratic Party will just go down with the ship? Like, if you see, because I watched that whole Meet the Press when they did um, all those stats and everything like that, they had um, Senator uh, Blumenthal from Connecticut on, and he basically was like, she asked him, uh, Kristen Welker, do you think that Joe Biden is still the um, best candidate? Yes, I believe that Joe Biden is still the best candidate. So he still has his advocates out there in the Senate 
who are basically saying, yeah, yeah, no, he's still our guy. What's the likelihood they're just, that's it. They see all the numbers. They see the polling, and they're like, nope, we're rolling with Biden. I, I think it's unlikely. I really do. Uh, he's, uh, he's, playing the, he's playing the inside game, but he doesn't really believe that. He's just saying it kind of because he has to. Uh, but I really think the handwriting's on the wall. I think they recognize if they renominate Biden, there's a high probability they lose. Uh, they don't understand the toxic mix they have of rising crime, the fentanyl crisis, the cities all now and states now all being broke because we have to spend for social services for this influx of Ill illegal migrants, uh, mixed messaging in the in the Middle East where we appear to be on both sides, yeah. funding both sides. A hundred billion dollars more for Iran. This is yeah. this is a death wish. This is insanity. You, Election. When you think about, you know, these guys were able to count ninety nine point four percent of all the votes in Argentina. OK. And it took us 40 days, <laughs> 30 days, whatever yeah. the timeline is to vote. Yeah. Weird. Is that weird? I mean, whether you're left, right, center doesn't like you. How the hell did a country like Argentina how were they able to, able to count as many votes as they did, as quickly as they did, and America can't do it? We are supposed to be the leaders of the free world. How is that possible? And because it's, because it's purposeful. Uh, they they have paper ballots in France. They counted thirty eight million votes in one day. It can be done, but it's it's instructive that no state, certainly none of the swing states, have had any significant reform in their elect state election laws that will govern the next presidential election since the last presidential election. With the one exception, there was a challenge to mail-in ballots uh, in Pennsylvania uh, as being unconstitutional. They clearly are. I mean, it's very specifically uh, laid out in the Constitution. The lower courts knocked them out. The middle courts sustained the lower courts. The state Supreme Court, which is extremely political, reinstated them. So we're going to have mail-in ballots in Pennsylvania again. In all honesty, I question whether you can win Pennsylvania as a Republican as long as you have mail-in ballots. The Philadelphia machine mm -hmm. uh, is uh, pretty famous uh, at their ability to manipulate these. So uh, will we have – there's two questions here. Will, can Trump win? Yes, he most definitely win, can win, meaning will there be enough votes to be a majority? Mm -hmm. But will we have a free, fair, honest, transparent election in which everyone has confidence? I think that's still an open question. Roger, w one more for you, if you don't mind – uh, you've been around politics for better half of 40 years, right? What will a second Trump presidency look like? You have an inside relationship with him. You know what's going on. What will that actually look uh, like think, for the I country? Think, I think it'll be a pretty radical. It'll be a pretty radical presidency. First of all, Dwight Eisenhower uh, deported 1.3 illegals. We have got to to take these people who entered the country illegally, and we have to deport them. It's not un, it's not unreasonable. They're not. Has illegal. he told you he wants to do that? He said it publicly. He doesn't okay. need to tell me. I mean, he's announced it. Uh, well, public statements are different than what he actually well, tells someone that he actually uh, but, is friends but, with. But he, but he, he, is, he has said it. Uh, he would reform, uh, you know, our intelligence agencies. He would certainly reform our law enforcement agencies. Mm -hmm. uh, I th he does these long-form policy videos, but because they're up on True Social, they don't get the kind of currency that they should get because they're very detailed uh, they're very well thought out, and his presentation's quite good, but they, they don't get the kind of attention they deserve. But he's on virtually every issue, he's put out detailed positions. Uh, I urge people to watch them. I got a couple of stories I want to get to before we get into uh, John F. Kennedy's 60 year anniversary coming up tomorrow. Sean Combs and singer Cassie set a lawsuit. I think it took 24 hours, record breaking how quickly this was. Hip hop mogul uh, Diddy and singer Cassie Ventura have reached a settlement in the uh, abuse lawsuit filed by Ventura. The terms of the settlement have not been disclosed. Ventura had accused Combs of using drugs and alcohol to control her during the decade-long relationship, alleging physical abuse and forced sexual acts with male prostitutes, including an alleged rape in 2018. Combs' lawyer has called these claims outrageous lies. The lawsuit also lists several of Combs' businesses as defendants and Combs' known as Puff Daddy, P. Diddy, and Diddy has a long history music industry and business ventures, including his Sean John clothing line. Vinny, what are your thoughts so, on this? So um, they reported this uh, on Barstool Sports. I saw something where they actually put all the court documents out there. So just to give you guys a little heads up of why he settled and it was so fast, uh, in the court documents, he had, uh, she, she alleged that he had 
severe rage issues. He would beat, he would regularly beat her, give her black eyes, fat lips, kick her in the face, kick her in the stomach. Uh, he would hire male escorts that would all wear masks. He'd give them all cocaine, ecstasy, ketamine, just to name a few, and he would have them all perform sexual acts, her, with them while he watched, masturbated, and filmed it. Okay, so no wonder why he doesn't want this out. He also beat her so bad once in the hallway of the Intercontinental Hotel that he paid $50,000 cash to the hotel to obtain the footage, which is what a great hotel because they're helping you cover up uh, your, your, your shitty attitude. Uh, now that we've been told that in the past, like think about this. We've been told believe all women, right? Adam, we talked about this the last time that this was mentioned. And hold their abusers accountable. Apparently, that's true unless you pay the person, you pay the female a lot of money, then it all, all, all goes away. Here's my question, Pat. What, what kind of standards are we ch teaching the younger women? Like find the man who's rich. He's famous, he's powerful. If he beats the hell out of you, forces you to have sex with people and, and do orgies and take all these drugs, that's fine. Just hold on to it because one day, just like what happened with her, it pays off. If they're true, if they're actually true and provable allegations, shouldn't he be in jail? To hell with the money, to hell with all that. What, what's the difference between him, Roger, than Bill Cosby or, or R. Kelly? She can prove these facts. This they're is the court? This is the court document? These are, court, these are the court documents, Pat. He's, he, he was drugging her bringing people to have sex he was recording it he's doing all this thing and what as as the Amer as Americans we're supposed to just go okay he paid her let's just all let it go away like is that is that the, is that what we want to teach the younger generation and these younger girls like listen you're going to get abused he's going to beat you he's going to do all this stuff he's going to make you have sex and do drugs but guess what Hold on to it because you're going to get paid in the future. I think that this is a shitty, shitty way. He belongs in jail. If R. Kelly's in jail and Bill Cosby got arrested, he belongs in jail. Those guys yeah. both went to trial. They both had trials. In this country, you're still innocent until proven guilty. Right. Those are still allegations. Shocking, yes, but yeah. this matter is not going to go to court. Maybe he doesn't want to go to court for a lot of reasons. I'll say this. There's nothing in his clothing line that I would be willing to do. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Adam? I, mean, I like this one. Ran out yeah. of his apartment with a firearm in pursuit of a rival industry executive who he learned was nearby. Ladies and gentlemen, in, in the world of hip-hop, that's called negotiation. Yeah. So, Adam, because you— Blew you, up you, a man's you, car. Did yeah, you he, miss that Yeah, he blew up— what's his, yeah, he blew, The guy was scared about— he was threatened to blow up his car and actually blew up. Because, Adam, last week you mentioned, you were like, eh, this whole believe all women, she's just trying to get money. I get it. I, I don't think that this is the case when she has all this information, all these allegations, and as him not to want it to go to court. What yeah, I think we've if we've learned anything over the last, uh, since basically 2017, the Me Too movement, that there's probably a gray area in between here. Of course. It's not black and white. It's not like he's all bad, she's all good. We saw during Johnny Depp. Turns out Amber Heard was a fucking shitting liar. Yeah. Okay? We all know what's going on with Andrew Tate. It's an absolute travesty. We see what's happening but with Russell Brand. there's a big Brand. difference. Here's a difference. What the difference is, Johnny Depp said, let's go to court and bring in the cameras. Yeah. D Diddy is saying, no, no, no. <laughs> no. Let's not go to court. I don't sure. want the cameras in the room, no. man. Unlike Johnny and Amber. No doubt. Yeah. I, again, but the, <coughs> everything that happened with Russell Brand. But the, do I think that Diddy was doing some wild ass shit for sure? Punching her in the face and beating her. But, That's okay. a whole different situation. Disgusting. Yeah. Horrible. horrible. No man should ever put his hands on a woman ever whatsoever. Yep. But here's the next question: Why didn't she leave? Why didn't she leave? Well, some people. I, I'm. I, she. She's got money. Okay. She was a hip hop star. You know, early two thousands. Why did she stay? That's my question. I got well, I, like if a guy's beating you, get the fuck out of there. Let's girl. easier. Well, why some some of these girls have that? What's that syndrome where they stay with the abuser? Stockholm, Stockholm. Stockholm. Stockholm syndrome. They, but I think I think I don't know they, if that's what's Adam, going on I, here. I, I, I don't think that that's the question in a situation like this. It's holding somebody like that because he's an evil. He seems like an evil piece of shit. And that's not only the rubrics. It's keeping him accountable. Look at all the like. If well, that, you know if, what you know uh, what keeps them accountable, Vinny, are the courts, and they settled, so it's over. Well, they say yeah, they settled, but I, uh, she I, didn't have to settle. I, she, she didn't have to settle. Yes, yeah, she didn't have to settle. But what I'm saying, she's gonna said, "Fuck you! I'm not taking your offer. I'm not settling." And they could have gone to court, but she settled. Yeah, she want. Yeah, because guess what? She wants compensation for everything that he's done. Exactly, I she's getting think, it. I still think settling is one thing, but holding him accountable. And so why him don't you call Cassie and say, "Listen, let me be your trial attorney. I'm not a lawyer. Let's take this to criminal not, court and what, let me what, handle what's this." What's your point, though? What's, that what, they, she settled. Just, we don't, you don't need to scream. What's your point I, with I'm, settling? I'm fired up. I know you yeah. are. I just okay. I, the, the audio is high. So, so sorry, what's your sorry. point with settling? Tell me. 
Well, so what's, obviously, what, your, if she the wanted, point you're making, so is this what? was a civil trial, right? This wasn't a yes. criminal yep. trial, yes. right? So a civil trial is what over money, over property, over human emotional damage. She has like post exactly. Dramatic. You're saying what? You're saying his evil because he settled fast. You're saying. Why are you settling if it's that important it, uh, to you? Exactly. Why are you taking the money? Correct. Okay, I get you. Yeah, it's, it's good points. She's you guys for thirty million dollars. <throat> she got somewhere between zero and thirty million dollars. She named her price. She got it. She's done. Great. And I will. You know, I I agree. A part of it is you're 19 years old. She's helping him get the career going. At that time, Diddy is Diddy. I mean, he's yeah. bigger than what he is but, today. Yeah. He helped her get her career going. Of course, exactly. Sorry, yeah, he of helped course. her get the career going. He was going. 37, she was 19, Have young, you seen hot. the clip of him running into studio from studio to studio to studio, and he runs in, and, and Cassie's there recording. You haven't seen this one? Uh, no, seen Very clip. interesting clips are going all over the place with what he was doing. This is a very interesting guy. Very interesting guy. That he is, and uh, uh, the, the 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 most fascinating part about this is while this is happening, how many people came out defending Diddy? Zero. I, didn't hear I haven't heard I didn't one hear person people. come on. I mean, you hey, get man. one or two His or attorney. three or four or five. Zero. You're right. Yeah. And, and he used to date J-Lo in 2000. And they, by the way, they asked J-Lo about what it was like to dating Diddy. You should see how she speaks. She speaks have that as if. She's speaking sign language. Oh, really? And, you know, she, she says, I wasn't mature enough. I had to really, uh, I wasn't ready for a relationship like that because back then I really didn't value myself. Like, Weird. it wasn't like, you know. Yeah. Anyways, it, it, and, listen, and I'm, go- not, I'm not a fan of a... Um, uh, anybody I talk to, nobody has good things to say about that. No, and, and how many... Uh, dude, and trust me, I've, I've heard way crazier, you know, allegations and stuff like that about him. But Adam, when you said, why why didn't she leave? So she was 19 years old with a 37-year-old superstar? That's kind of, you know... Yeah, don't, but it's some not those, like they dated for six months, Vinny. They were together 10 years. Yeah, but when they started dating okay, her, 19. Okay, she's a grown-up yeah, but at 19, this point. Not at 19 years old, Adam. She's uh, with yeah, the, exactly. So it started but, then. But they, it's not like they had a two-month stint. They were together 10 years. Yeah. So meaning she was 19 until she he, she's basically 30. Yeah. So it's not like she's some child I understand. that couldn't make her own decisions. May- if, if he's hitting her, that's horrible. Never do that to a woman. If he's drugging her, doing this weird-ass shit, zero, zero advocacy for that. But she needs to say, you know what? I don't care that this guy's a full-on billionaire. I don't care that this guy made my career. Right. I'm out. Let's transition out to an important story. New study reveals one in four remote workers are sneaking off to have sex while on the job. What? Yeah, it just came out. Yeah, Where's it's, Tom? It's Tom? Extremely uh, uh, interesting. And by the way, you know <laughs> whose story this is? Worker. You know whose story this is? Fox News. Oh, okay, great. Go figure. What page so, is this? Tom? 18. A recent study by Calendar Labs revealed that 26% of remote workers work, workers in the U.S. are engaging in sexual activities during work hours with researchers noting as remote work becomes more common, it tracks that scheduled intimacy extends into workplace. For some who work from home, remote workers have been using emojis like sandwich, headphones, (laughs) or fire to deceive colleagues and bosses, leading them to believe they're occupied with work-related tasks while they are actually having sex. The trend is unlimited to remote workers as one in 10 office workers have also found opportunities for sexual encounters at work. The study highlights that scheduled intimacy correlates with higher relationships, satisfaction with 49% of those who plan ahead, reporting higher overall satisfaction and better intimacy fulfillment compared to those who don't. Vinny? I Listen, if you, you, we were talking about this, maybe this might be helping the fact that we're not having enough, enough babies. But like, like you have to, you have to put, a, you have to put a sandwich and be like, if you're at home, pal, what do you think people are doing? It's not, it's not only that they're doing other stuff. You know well, what I mean? I don't, I, it kind of explains why you and Brady are always running off to lunch in the middle of the day. Yeah, okay. you know. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, we all know that you get a job for money, for income, but also benefits. Mm-hmm. What comes with the benefits? You get you know, insurance. You get your 401k. Maybe there's a profit sharing plan. Yeah. And maybe you get a little uh, sexy time during lunch. I think it works out well for uh, employees. What do you think, Raj? Where do I shine up? <laughs> <laughs> Raj <and> Stone. <laughs> Want to work from home? Anybody? Working from home. Well, we saw some economic reports that said 33% of America were worried about getting laid off, and then 22% are just worried about getting laid off. Did you just say laid off? And 22% are just worried about getting laid. So it's like, excuse me, what was the question? But 
you know, Pat, you've told some wild ass stories about what you've seen in your day. These two, these two, these two have been, I came into the office on a Sunday. These, they've been working very hard. You've built a company with 30,000 plus insurance agents. A lot of them I, are couples. I, I, you've I, dealt with a lot of this stuff I really before. wonder, like this work from home phenomenon, like that these young generations deceive some of these companies that fell for this trap. Like, uh, I work harder at home than I do at the office. Who the hell believes that? You're an independent contractor. You work 1099. You're a consultant. Whatever. It is what it is. We got plenty of them. And I've been in that space for, you know, what do you call it, uh, 20 years. But you got W-2 full-timers working from home claiming they're more efficient at home than they are at the office. It took three years to realize that was an absolute myth. Now, this may be a... Another reason why they may be selling the benefits of working from home. Exactly. And uh, who knows whether it's going to work for their favor or not. You guys know where I stand when it comes down to this. Okay. All right. Next story is teen boys are falling for a Snapchat nude photo scam. Here's how to avoid it. This is a Wall Street Journal story. Okay. Parents, listen up. It's a worthy story for you to see what's going on here with Snap. So scammers are targeting teen boys in an online nude photo scam posing as teen girls to solicit explicit photos from the boys and then demanding money via peer-to-peer -peer payment apps, uh, threatening to share their photos if they don't pay. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children have seen a significant increase in reports of this type of financial extortion with over 12,500 cases this year reported. Snapchat's parent company conducted a survey revealing that 65% of respondents or their friends have been targeted, targeted in schemes where attackers obtain explicit personal imagery, and threaten to release it. Most of the victims are boys. Parents and teens can take preventative measures, including educating teens about such scams, advising them to engage with strangers, requesting explicit content, protecting their social media accounts, and supervising payment apps. Tom. Look, you know what this is? This is a failure in parenting. That phone, that computer, that laptop is not a babysitter for your kids. This is a failure of parenting because you know what? You know, predators have, have been around forever. There is the playground predators, predators that were often kids candy and trying to cajole them. And then they would go off and exploit them and worse. And, and you just have... Your parents here, parents and schools need to work together because in the digital world here, this is what's going on. And what they're not talking about in this is we we have seen statistics on suicides of girls under 16 that are relating to being cornered or shamed and being terribly fearful. And so I, I think what's going on here, you need to know what your kids are doing, what we do. And I'll give you a tip here. And I saw a talk on this. I wasn't born with this information, but God bless the people put it together. I teach my girls to reason and resist, to reason with what's going on. First of all, foundation of what's right and wrong. Don't put yourself in this position, but to reason when you encounter people and things that look weird and people are approaching you and stuff and to resist the temptation to be included and to resist, you know, things like social media where I don't know what good happens on social media, but I, I this is, this is, this is downstream from parenting, absent parenting, and upstream decisions like letting your kids just use that phone and use that iPad and use that PC all day. What are they doing? They're going to these sites, and professionals are getting to them. Tom, let me ask you a follow-up on that PBD as well. And Rob, you have got, you've got a teenage boy, so I, it, it's pretty clear. I don't have any kids. I, I uh, have a nephew who's 10 years old, but... The, the, the parenting game has changed. You know, when we were raised, what were they saying? Like, you know, don't get into strangers' cars. Uh, yeah. You know, don't take candy from strangers. It was basically like, go out, play, do your thing. Just don't talk to random-ass strangers. Now all the strangers are on the Internet. Yeah. Okay, and they're hitting you up, and they're doing all this weird-ass stuff. And parents are, haven't been trained for this. You know, when did the Internet even become popular as far as social media goes? 2010, 2012, maybe before that a little bit with Facebook? So what steps can parents take, especially if there's no parenting social media class or they haven't been raised on this stuff? What, what can parents do to basically, un, what do you call it? 
uh, resist and reason and resist. Reason and resist. What's now, your the, message for parents out there? My message for parents, and, and I like to hear what Roger thinks about this. Distracted youth have been an issue for a long time. When TV really exploded and it was more than just soap operas on in the afternoon, people are like, don't let your kids just sit there and watch TV all day. You know, that's not the way to distract yeah. them. But the TV wasn't DMing you. No, but it was the point is there's been distraction versus productive things. Number one, engaging with your kids. Number two, knowing what they're engaging with. Number three, encouraging them and rewarding them for things like reading and getting grades in school. And, you know, it, it, Look, we know how to manage companies. Whatever gets measured gets managed. It's an amazing thing. You know, people that want a bonus or a promotion, whatever you manage, suddenly they cooperate and do things. You change your bonus structure. Hey, we, the company has to hit a certain revenue, and we have to have a certain profit, and if the company gets a profit, then we pay you. Suddenly, everybody's very interested every month on how the company's doing on profit because they want their bonus. But I, I think I think it, it, starts, it starts there. Are, are you engaged with your kids' lives, and are you giving them incentives to do the good things? Roger. Uh, parents and grandparents are using uh, the cell phone or the computer as a babysitter, and they're not monitoring what their kids are looking at. I, I have three young grandchildren. My kids watch very carefully what their kids are, are looking at, uh, and, they, and they use some of the programs to block you know, certain, certain apps and so on. Uh, I think it's just a, a total absence of parental responsibilities. Like kids, leave me alone. Go, 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 go look at the computer. It's like they're using them as babysitters. It's very dangerous. Yeah. <clears throat> and, by, and by the way, awareness education is the key to all of this stuff. Uh, it, there's a movie I recommend every parent to watch uh, husband, wife, watch it first before you want to show it to your kids. Cause it's pretty dark. It's called disconnect. Uh, with Jason Bateman. If you've never seen it, go watch this movie as soon as possible. It'll tell you the dark side of what's going on right now and how kids are being affected by this. Okay. Um, what story do we want to go? Let's go to the story and then we'll wrap it up with, uh, uh, I think I'll combine these two together. So Elon Musk's ex-advertisement nightmare companies that have boycotted the app and it is not slowing down right now. If you can go to page 15, here we go. So uh, Elon Musk is facing a major boycott from companies and government bodies that are from an, uh, after endorsing an allegedly anti-Semitic post on X. Musk responded to a post that seemed to promote an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, sparked backlash. Major companies, including Apple, IBM, European Commission, Disney, Paramount, Sony Pictures, Warner Brothers, Sky and NBC Universal owner Comcast, have suspended advertising on X in response to Musk's controversial remarks. Media Matters reported that ads from big brands were appearing Alongside pro-Nazi content on the platform, the White House condemned Musk's promotion of anti-Semitism and Musk's respond uh, uh, by vowing to protect free speech on X, claiming media matters, mis misrepresented the platform's user experience and accusing them of cr uh, trying to undermine freedom of speech. Tom. Uh, first of all, I find it very interesting how the media has lined up 100% against the guy that was trying to put uh, free speech out there and not just cancel accounts and take them off Twitter. Very interesting. Disney, Paramount, Sony Pictures, Warner Brothers, Sky, NBC Universal, and its owner Comcast. That's interesting. All the people that have been very frustrated that they can't force X and Twitter to cancel a lot of conservative and moderate voices. Interesting. And then Apple and IBM joining. Look. Was it the best um, post that Elon Musk has made this year? No. Is it at a very inflammable time that's going on right now? Yes. But I look also to, to what Elon Musk said in a more extended, you know, a, a segment from an interview where he was explaining what was going on. And I think he was very clear about it. And I think people are choosing to be inflamed about this because he's a target in the first place. Well, and, and uh, based on the lawsuit he filed in Texas yesterday, Media Matters has basically manipulated this, so what they claim is not even true. Uh, it's an extraordinary lawsuit. How coincidental Correct. that the head of all those companies are the same people who met with Chairman Xi yeah. uh, in San Francisco last week. How incredibly coincidental. Elon Musk, there are very, very few people who can say that they changed the course of history. Elon Musk is one of those few people. His, his acquisition of Twitter... Uh, and his revelations about the manipulation of Twitter under the previous ownership have literally changed the course of history. 
Well, the I'm sort of a uh, free speech absolutist, right? Like, unless it's inciting violence, I would say, go ahead and say it. I can't tell you how much Jew hatred I've gotten, um, even before the Hamas-Israel war. And it's disgusting. It's horrible. But I'm a grown-ass man. I'd rather hear all the negativity uh, online and, okay, cool, this is what uh, well, I'm dealing means? with, rather than they're saying it amongst themselves. And be the, by the way, whether it's Jew hatred, whether it's racist stuff, whether it's anti-Arab stuff, Islamophobia, anti-LGBT, people are going to say their shit, whatever they have. It's horrible, it's disgusting, but, you know, it's... Not only do I defend your right to say it, even, I defend your right to say it even if it hurts my feelings. Uh, well, and I think we're at a point in this country where feelings are getting hurt, and that's fine. And as long as you don't call for violence, which some are, by the way, uh, I, I think it's in within your right to say it, even though it's disgusting. Well, I feel pretty strong about this because I'm banned for life on Facebook. I'm banned for life on Instagram. I'm banned for life on YouTube. Uh, I'm obviously really? the most dangerous person uh, in the world. By the yeah. way, there is somebody on Facebook right now. pretending to be me. Uh, I've had several p people who are members, including my wife, complain about it. He's, he's got 6,500 followers, which is pretty good, but he is not me. They won't take it down. So, uh, no, I, I think uh, what Musk has done is really courageous. Uh, and the political as uh, aspects of it, the fact that our intelligence agencies were leaning uh, on the company to uh, to censor certain uh, profiles, certain people, certain messages, Hunter Biden's laptop, and so on. This has really kind of changed our politics in a in a very a very substantial way. And I would point out to you now, the Biden administration is has put forward regulations for the FCC to regulate content on the internet. So we're now going to go above the social media program uh, pl uh, platforms to try to get censorship at that level. It's extra it's unconstitutional. Here, it's extraordinarily dangerous. Here's what Sasha Baron Cohen told TikTok leaders. He said they are creating the biggest anti-Semitic movement since the Nazis. Uh, so, by the way, and this is a left-wing Jewish celebrity, Sasha Baron Cohen, expressed concerns during a private uh, call with TikTok leaders about the platform's role in spreading anti-Semitism. Cohen criticized TikTok, stating what is happening on TikTok is it is creating the biggest anti-Semitic movement since the Nazis. Deborah Messing, known for her role in Will and Grace, emphasized that TikTok, a China-owned company, has become the main platform from dis dis dissemination of Jew hate. She pointed to the, pro uh, to the use of the slogan, from the river to the sea, and questioned TikTok's policy on addressing anti-Semitic content. Look, you know, on one end, you have one argument with uh, Twitter. On the other end, you have another argument with TikTok. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts for yourself from what Sasha is saying here? I mean, it's true. Uh, you see what's going on out there. And uh, yeah, it's it's sad. But, I mean, I just kind of addressed this before. I, I Look, I grow up. I, I'm coming to Miami. It's a melting pot. I'm friends with Jewish people, Catholic people, Christian people, Hispanic people, black people, Asian people, Jamaican, Haitian, the whole thing. And I've never dealt with any of this. Like, the first time I ever dealt with Jew hatred was when I went to play college football in North Carolina. And I told, this is actually a funny story. And uh, all the, all the, um, I, I basically didn't practice on Yom Kippur, which is basically the holiest day of the Jewish. And I'm not very religious, but I'm, I believe in tradition. I believe in uh, my culture. And I told the coach, I said, hey, I can't practice today. It's Yom Kippur. And this is like, he was like a 75-year-old white guy in North Carolina. He's never, I don't even think he's seen a Jew. Yeah. He goes, uh, Yom, what? <laughs> I said, uh, it's Yom Kippur, the, the Day of Atonement. It's kind of like, kind of like Easter for Christians. Uh, uh, Yom, what? <laughs> Boy, get out there, put your pads on. on. We got to get practice. We got a big game this Sunday, <laughs> this Saturday. I'm like, uh, yeah, I can't, I, I'm not allowed to eat today. I'm not like, but I'm here. I'll just watch practice. Boy, I didn't want to hear what this yum kipper thing is all about here, boy. <laughs> just, you know what? You know what? Put on your pads. Yeah. Walk around and pick up trash. Yeah. I was like, really? I got to. Yum gotta, Kipper. Gotta, gotta go pick up trash on Yum Kipper. <laughs> and I was just like, all right, this guy's never been around Jewish. It's fine. So I picked up trash. No big deal. But since that since that time, all my teammates started calling me Brew. Uh, short for Hebrew. Yeah, I love that. I was like, this this school's awesome. Yeah. So uh, didn't spend much time there. Transferred to Florida State. Did my thing there. But 
I, I've realized that you know, like what Jews are what one percent of America, point one percent of the world, yet we're the we're the cause of all the world's problems. It's sort of obnoxious to me. And Jews have dealt with this since uh, eternity, and they've been scapegoated throughout history, whether it's in Egypt, whether it's the Spanish Inquisition, whether it's Nazi Germany, and whether it's what's going on today. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I guess, in a sense, Zionist, where I do believe that Jews need a home and a safe space, and that is now called modern-day Israel. And even that is the nicest place in the worst neighborhood in the world. And uh, it's sad to see what's going on, but um, Jews, uh, they, they have a, uh, us Jews, we have a phrase that has basically culminated since the Holocaust, which is never again. Uh, people want to exterminate us. Famously, they say if uh, people of Palestine put, on, put down all their guns, there will be peace. If the people of Israel put down their guns, they will all be massacred. So the Jews have had to build up the IDF and the Mossad and build up a defense mechanism not to be slaughtered for the sake that they are just Jews. So for me, uh, I'm not the most religious person. You know, I'm not going to temple or church like you guys are going every Sunday. But I do understand what's going on in the world right now, and it's sad to see. And people need to speak out about it. So Sasha Baron Cohen, good for you. And I, and, and I think the, the Elon thing is ridiculous because Media Matters is a complete shitty horrible like I, I media matter sucks this is the, the question was about tiktok and you know that's a china-owned company how much they, they're pushing the lgbtq on uh, on the youth hold on hard hardcore yeah. they have all these challenges pat that make the youth do what tide pod challenges to just lighting yourself on fire challenges they're brainwashing the youth they're being anti so like and but here's the thing adam what do they china could do whatever they want didn't Trump try to say that he wanted to get rid of yeah. TikTok? We yeah. were at the RNC debate. I don't know if you That's, were there in Miami. Uh, uh, no, I was in Hialeah okay. at the Trump rally. Oh, the Trump yeah. rally. Respect. Okay. But, but, but Adam, like, Ch 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 China can do whatever yeah. they want. And guess what? It's it's out there. It, you can see what they're doing. They, the, Sasha Baron Cohen knows what's up. But what are you going to do? China could do <laughs> both. China comes to San Francisco. They grab all the homeless and kick them out. And somebody taught, said this the other day, Pat. Where are those homeless people? Apparently, like, they're, they disappeared. All the people in those streets, uh, apparently there was vans driving around Roger, picking them up, putting them in the vans, and getting rid of them. They haven't come back. Where are those thousands of homeless people that were in San Francisco? You ever notice that? Uh, but gone. But Pons again, the, the most outrageous part of this is Media Matters America, which is a smear operation, accusing Elon Musk of anti-Semitism on the basis of manipulated uh, stuff on the site is complete bullshit. Yep. He is most definitely not an anti-Semite. It's a bum rap. Mm -hmm. It's a smear. Yeah, a yeah. guy that's trying to save the human race is racist towards one. Get out, like, give me a guy's break. worth three hundred billion dollars. Yeah, can buy countries, small countries, <laughs> yeah. if he wants to, and he's going to go out there and do what yeah. he's doing here. He anyway, Jewish people. Let's wrap it up with. Uh, uh, let's wrap it up with uh, the sixty-year anniversary tomorrow, John F. Kennedy assassination. I've had a lot of different people on, Roger, on this topic. You've written a book on it, a New York Times bestselling book, The Man Who Killed Kennedy, The Case Against LBJ. I had a guy on uh, the podcast, uh, I interviewed him six years ago, Jim Jenkins. Rob, if you can pull this up. When I was interviewing Jim Jenkins, I asked him a question. Uh, he was one of the four people in the room that held um, John F. Kennedy's brain, okay, Jim mm. Jenkins. And we released this interview on, it could have been the one of the anniversary dates, and a video was taken down for six hours. It was trending in a very good way, and then it was, came back up the next day. And I said, who out of all the people, you know, who do you think was behind it? This is a guy that's been away for 50 years. He was in the military, was in the Navy, doesn't want any attention, doesn't do any interviews, doesn't talk to anybody. Somehow, some way, we got him to feel comfortable to come and talk to us. And I had him on the, on the show, and his wife was sitting right next to me. They've been married for 50-plus years. He says, the, only per the one man that makes me feel very uncomfortable is Lyndon Johnson, is who he said. Well, how did you come to the conclusion that Lyndon Johnson was behind the assassination of John F. Kennedy? Uh, basically, Richard Nixon told me that. Wow. He said that the Warren Commission was the biggest goddamn hoax in American history. Uh, and uh, I had uh, I'd always had my suspicions, but... The point here is that everybody who's analyzed the Kennedy assassination looks at it through a specific prism. So 
Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is right when he says the CIA is involved. Uh, others are right when they say organized crime was involved. Yet others are right when they say the FBI was involved, the Secret Service, Big Texas Oil, uh, the international banks. But Lyndon Johnson is the linchpin. He is the nexus to all of those institutions and individuals. And he is the man who has the most acute interest. Lyndon Johnson is under federal investigation in the Bobby Baker scandal and the Billy Sal Estes scandal. Robert Kennedy's begun telling people he's going to be charged. John Kennedy tells Evelyn Lincoln, his personal secretary, on his way to Dallas on the plane, Johnson is being dropped from the ticket. Johnson is a man staring into the abyss. He knows he is going to prison. Uh, Drew Pearson, the most influential columnist of the day, already has a column uh, in the can for that Sunday, the day after Kennedy's supposed to be in Dallas, nailing Johnson for taking a bribe for a general dynamics uh, defense appropriation. So Johnson has motive, means, uh, and opportunity. He's the man who insists that Kennedy go to, to Dallas to bind up the wounds between the progressive and bourbon wings of the Democratic Party. He goes to Kennedy's hotel room the night before and tries to change the motorcade seating to put his hated enemy, Senator Ralph Yarbrough, in the death car with Kennedy and move his former uh, administrative assistant, Governor John Connolly, to the vice presidential car. Kennedy says, no, that defeats the whole purpose of why I'm here. I need to be seen with Connolly, the head of the more conservative wing of the party. Uh, and, and in my book, I, I prove using eyewitness evidence, fingerprint evidence in deep Texas politics that Johnson uh, and all these other entities, each of whom has their own motive, the CIA uh, about the uh, uh, the anger over the, uh, uh, the Bay of Pigs failure, the anger over Kennedy's secret deal, to, uh, to remove our missiles from Turkey and Italy in the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, big oil over the repeal of the, tex of the uh, oil depletion allowance, uh, organized crime who feels double-crossed by JFK because they financed his election and they bended arms for him, broke arms for him in Chicago and in Texas in 1960, in which he wins a, a razor-thin uh, victory. So everybody has a, a, their own individual interest, the banks, because Kennedy's demanding a silver back dollar. They don't want to go there. But Johnson has a unique relationship with each one of them. And I actually prove that uh, among the fingerprints found on the cardboard boxes in the crow's nest uh, is the fingerprint for a man named Malcolm Mac Wallace, uh, who was Rob, who was convicted, who was convicted uh, in 1951 of murder. That's how we have his fingerprints. Wow. He murdered uh, a man named uh, uh, Douglas uh, Kinzer. Uh, who was in a love trial with Johnson's sister and who was trying to blackmail Lyndon Johnson. Uh, he was represented at trial by Johnson's personal attorney, John Kofer, uh, and he's the only man in the history of Texas to be convicted of murder and get a suspended sentence, whereupon he then goes to work at Temco, a defense contractor owned by D.H. Byrd, one of the financiers of, of uh, Johnson's career, and the owner of the Texas School Book Depository Building. So uh, when I asked Nixon point blank after a couple cocktails, because <laughs> Nixon was very buttoned down, <laughs> it was very hard to get him to talk, you know, retrospectively about anything. It was very forward looking until nine thirty. Until he had a couple of uh, silver bullets, as he would call them. Yes. He had a couple martinis, and then he got loquacious. And I said, uh, I said to him, um, "So, Mr. President, let me ask you a question: Who, who really killed John Kennedy?" He kind of stared into his martini and. Uh, he shuddered and he said, uh, well, Dallas. I said, I I'm sorry, sir, I don't understand. He said, uh, let me put it to you another way. Lyndon and I both wanted to be president. The difference was I wasn't willing to kill for it. Wow. But there it is. He laid it right out. And that was really my inspiration. It took me five years to write this book, but that was really my, uh, my inspiration for writing the book. Uh, so when Robert Kennedy says the CIA did it, he's not wrong. Uh, you know, when Sam Jean Conda's daughter writes a terrific book that says that the mob did it, she's not wrong. I mean, everybody has their own interest, but Johnson has a unique relationship with each. Tom, what do you add with this when you hear this? Because I know you put a lot of time into this, not at the levels of Roger. So I um, I landed where Roger land because I, I, I look at, you know, the immediacy of impact. I look at 
And, you know, people say 24 hours. I don't think it was 24 hours. I think it was 84 hours. Lyndon Johnson was basically um, allowing the military industrial complex to do what they wanted, which was to get more federal money to replenish arms. And they were going to use up those arms in Vietnam. So it's literally that's correct, right? It's like three and a half yes. days, yep. three and a half days. The national period of mourning is not over. And Lyndon Johnson has greenlit the uh, Vietnam War, number one. And number two, he's provided assurances to Alan Dulles of the CIA, who ended up on the Warren Commission. Who Kennedy had just fired. Who Kennedy had just fired because Kennedy gave the famous quote, the CIA needs to be torn in little pieces and scattered to the winds of history. Mm -hmm. I'm butchering the quote, but that was essentially a quote, correct? Smashed into a million pieces and scattered to the wind. Did because they had be, be, because they had betrayed him. So the Bay of Pigs master plan included 29 Panamanian flagged bombers flown, were supposed to be flown by Cuban pilots. Correct. Uh, so that's the air cover for the men storming the beach. Unbeknownst to JFK, uh, Charles Cable, the number two man in the CIA, whose brother Earl just happens to be the mayor of Dallas, uh, cancels that. So the, the men are now being chopped up on the beach, uh, and Curtis LeMay, the, the head of the Air Force, head of the Joint Chiefs, uh, goes to JFK and says, we have to send in the Air Force. Well, this is a provocation for war with the Russians. That's exactly what Kennedy agreed to the Bay of Pigs plan, only if it had plausible deniability. It was supposed to look like an indigenous Cuban invasion. And air cover so he, coming from a separate country, right, not us. So he, so he says, no, the CIA blames him for the failure. He blames them for the failure. So there, there is their motive. Also, and this is the most controversial thing, Kennedy has, uh, is being treated by Dr. Max Jacobson, Dr. Feelgood, uh, on an early version of methamphetamine, which he thinks he's taking a, a blend of enzymes and vitamins, and it makes him feel better. He's a, real, he's a genuine war hero, and he's in incredible pain his entire life. He's wearing a back brace. He can barely walk. I think this both explains why he's so horny, why he is, you know, chasing all the time. Uh, and it also... Uh, he's on steroids constantly. He's on steroids. Yeah. This is who, by the way? Jeff. Pardon me? This is who you're John talking about? John Kennedy. He's on John steroids. John Kennedy. Uh, yeah. If you look at the manifest to when Kennedy goes to Vienna for the summit with Khrushchev, Dr. Max Jacobson, uh, who is uh, who is doctor to the stars, he is, he is administering his concoction to Frank Sinatra, to Maria Calais, to uh, Aristotle Onassis, to Nelson Rockefeller, to uh, to Joe DiMaggio, to Marilyn Monroe. I mean, he, he is uh, to Pablo Casals. I mean, this guy is uh, is pushing drugs and everybody thinks they're taking an all natural formula that makes them feel better. Robert Kennedy learns about this. He gets this substance that Kennedy's injected. He sends it out to the FBI lab and they tell him what it is. And he goes back to his brother and he says, you can't. And by this time, John Kennedy has Jackie Kennedy taking it. Uh, and uh, sure. Robert Kennedy says to his brother, you, this is dangerous. You can't be doing this. And he said, I don't care if it's horse piss. It makes me feel better. Uh -huh. wow. so, uh, so I think this is how they rash. This is how I think the intelligence agencies and those involved in the murder of Kennedy, this is how they rationalize it. Good God, the man's a drug addict. He's going to give away the store to Nikita Khrushchev. We can't trust him in Vienna. This is how they justify two, it. Two follow-up questions there for you. One of them is, first time around, Trump never released the Kennedy stuff. And second time around, you know, everybody's like, how come you didn't do it? You know, we wanted to have the information. It's like, well, you know, not yet. And it keeps getting delayed by both parties. Yes, What's the who the hell is the group that goes and sits with the president that claims before they get elected that we're going to tell the information of what happens that convinces them to say, listen, if there's one thing you cannot release is the fact that we killed Kennedy, because if you do, CIA is going to turn against you. What does that conversation sound like when they sit with a president? Well, uh, Trump has been very blunt about this. So. Uh, in 2017, I brought it to his attention that the that the Presidential Records Act, the Kennedy Assassination Records Act, meant that everything would be released uh, during the the first year of his presidency, unless he held any of it back. And he said, well, "What do you think I should do?" I said, "You should release it all. Why wouldn't you? It's been at that point 50 years." Uh, and uh, Mike Pompeo, the head of the CIA, convinced him uh, that releasing it all would expose our methods uh, and sources. Well, first of all, the sources part is ridiculous. There's nobody still alive who was involved in this national scandal. But secondarily, 
if they were involved in killing an American president, we, we really need to know that. So in the end, Trump agrees to hold 20 percent back. I believe that 20 percent proves definitively what we learned in the last couple of days. Oswald uh, is not the shooter. But more importantly, Kennedy shot from the front and back. There are multiple shooters. Mm -hmm. uh, Oswald is uh, well known to the CIA, well known to the FBI. They both deny that. Uh, and now it goes to Joe Biden. And Biden does the same thing. He releases more, but he still holds a little bit back. It's time for the American people to know the because complete if you truth. Think, if you think about the end of the day, Pat, if, if they release that, Roger, and we find out that the CIA and the FBI together killed a president, what had the CIA and the FBI are just, they're finished. It, just, it, it, certainly, hurt, it certainly hurts their question. But, Afuera. But for, Afuera. But for, for, Afuera. Uh, the Warren Commission so. never had the autopsy photos. They were never granted access to the autopsy photos. Lee Harvey Oswald is tested for powder burns. There are no, there, the paraffin test comes back negative. He hasn't shot a Are you saying that, that Lee Harvey I, Oswald I, did not pull the trigger? Did not, I, most I, definitely I, did I, not pull the complete trigger. Complete setup. Three complete minutes setup. on Max 7. Tom, I'll give you the final, and I got final question before we wrap up. Well, I was it. saying it all points to LBJ because you take a look at the things that LBJ did immediately thereafter, and they were counter to all the things that Kennedy was doing. And then there's there's been wiretaps and statements that came out of the mob where they all discussed why are we being stabbed in the back by Joe Kennedy using RFK to prosecute all the mobsters of America except the ones that are on his lineage, and they actually had considered offing RFK, and they said, don't do that, because Kennedy and Joe will flip this country upside down, and there'll be no trials, there'll just be murders. And they said, we can't go after Bobby. You have to go after the head of the snake. Yep. And the snake was Joe Kennedy. The head of the snake was JFK, because JFK's pen in the White House that gave authority to RFK, Attorney General, was allowing Joe Kennedy to conduct a retaliatory revenge campaign under the pen of his son, the Attorney General. So this is not conspiracy. This is what happened. And you had the mob saying it was happened. And so you look at everything there. That's why she says the mob did it. If she, yeah, she's right. They were interested. She's, she's right. Last question for you. Yep. Okay. John Hinckley. Okay. Mm -hmm. he, he, he's got some interesting connections to certain people as well. What happened with Reagan? Was that intentional? Was he connected? Was he sent? Is there any theory? You read about this. It's some interesting, his brother, all this stuff. Where, where do you go with that? If you read my Bush, the my book, The Bush Crime Family, I make, a, I make my first case that George H.W. Bush is complicit in the assassination attempt on Reagan. Uh, several things about it. First of all, the government has never released a any of the final report. Uh, Leslie Stahl, uh, and, then of CBS, and Judy Woodruff, then of NBC, both report a second shooter on a balcony above the entrance to the Hilton Hotel. But when you look at the photos, the news photos, he's been cropped out of the photo. I, I located the original photo. There, it's like with JFK, there are too many bullets. They're not all accounted for. Reagan is hit from a upward trajectory, but, but Hinckley is crouching. Uh, there are a lot of questions. Uh, Hinckley's uh, father, John Hinckley Sr., is a partner at Zapata Oil in Texas. He is well known to the Bush family. Uh, Neil Bush, one of the Bush sons, is supposed to meet with John Hinckley uh, Jr.'s brother for dinner that night. I'm working on a new book to take the old stuff I already have, which is pretty convincing, but add all of the new stuff that I have uncovered. Uh, I, I think um, at the time, Bush uh, and uh, Secretary of State Alexander Haig were in a struggle over control of foreign policy under the Reagan administration, uh, and this was Bush's move to take control. There you go. If you want to know more, gang, about what uh, Roger's been talking about, order the New York Times bestseller, The Man Who Killed Kennedy, The Case Against LBJ. The link will be below. And, and get the paperback because it has three extra chapters. Okay, get the paperback because it's got three extra chapters. And one of you... Want a signed copy for those of you guys that did the survey, mm -hmm. Rob, if we have the name so I can announce it. If uh, uh, you do have it, just give it. If you don't have it. Sure. The winner is Mississippi, Japan. What? That's the user's That's name? That's the user's name. Mississippi, Japan is the winner of the signed copy of The Man Who Killed Mississippi Kennedy. Mississippi, Japan. Mississippi, Japan. And last but not least, for those of you that want to get direct contact with Roger, asking him any questions. By the way, when it comes down to strategy... This man's been involved in politics. He is loved. He's hated. 
He is criticized. He is feared. But the man's got a lot of experience in politics the last 50 uh, years. And he was one of the first, if not the first, to say Trump's one day going to be a president after a conversation he had with him. If you want to get in, ta- in contact with him, maybe even have a phone call or FaceTime with him, you can find him on Manek. Rob, do we have the link below as well for Manek? Yes, it's in if, the post, and it's also in the chat. If you can go to the chat and you go to Manek, just click on it, go there, DM him. He'll respond back with a video or a text. Or you can have a 15, 30-minute call, FaceTime call, with the one and only Roger Stone. Roger, thanks for being on. This was Appreciate fantastic. It. Gang, I believe we're doing a podcast Thursday morning on Thanksgiving, so we will properly... Wish you a happy Thanksgiving on Thanksgiving. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye, bye-bye.